in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Live from Boston, Massachusetts, at the Drew Estate Cigar Studios, and live from Indian Trail, North Carolina, with me, my co-host, Mr. William Cooper. That's right. It's another episode of the Spare Note series. My name is Matt Tobacco from SmokingTobacco.com, and it's time once again to go over all of the do's and don'ts, the what happened, what should happen in the cigar industry. Uh, Coop, thanks for being here with me once again. Matt, have, happy, uh, new, yep, happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. I forgot yep. all about that. Happy New Year to everybody. Yep, absolutely. Um, it's officially day one. And uh, let's, let's, see where this, uh, let's see where this year takes us. It's either going to be a bumpy ride or maybe a not so rough ride, but definitely not perfect. Um, I am going to cut up and light my number one cigar of the year, the Drew Estate Uncrowned 10 Toro. Coop, what are you smoking? Uh, I'm gonna, I actually, just to be different, I said I'm going to go with my number two cigar from 2020. This Ooh. is the uh, Lito Gomez uh, Small Bites Number 7 from La Florida Minicana. Great cigar. Great, uh, it's a great it's cigar. A great cigar. A little homage. I heard uh, I saw the show with John the other night, so I figured do a little homage to him. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, John was with us. Yep. Yep. So uh, it was a good show. And uh, so there's a little homage with that uh, because this was a – I think this was a sleeper cigar from last year for sure. I, I have really stocked up on a lot of these too. So uh, I have I have enough to keep me through the year, I'm sure. And what I tend to do with these is like like I tend to buy these up. You know, you can't really buy the box because it's a huge crate. But I right. buy them up, and then I keep a few like for years to come. So I have some some of the sixes, which was like a number three cigar of the year for me a few years ago. I have it on those. So um, so uh, it's a great cigar. Um, you get a number two cigar of the year. It's, it's not a consolation prize on Coop, is what I tell people. Right. Uh, so, and I don't, I don't think it's a consolation prize for anybody, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, when you get, you get, you get in the rankings like that, you're splitting hairs probably at that point. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it, we'll get right into the whole list thing. You know, a lot of yeah. people are unveiling the number one cigar of the year. We have already completed our list. Uh, cigar and Spirits magazine also just announced today. Um, Underground Ten. Is their number one cigar of the year? Yep. yep. Cigar Authority just threw the crown over to the wonderful Mickey Peg at All Saints Cigars with the St. Francis, which was my number two cigar of the year. My number twenty-two. Um, my number twenty-two. But thought it was great. Uh, twenty-two. I, I don't know. I gotta check that. You list. make <laughs> listen. You make tw- listen. You make twenty because my listen. The thing is with cigars, I read about one hundred and sixty to one hundred and seventy cigars a year. Right. So it's that you have to be reviewed to be on the list. Mm-hmm. Get number. You get number twenty-two. You're you're, you're in the upper echelon now. So yeah. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. And everyone does it different, you know, and that's, yeah, and, we, and that's, we're definitely going to kind of touch on that. In absolutely. Ways absolutely. Yep. Throughout the show. Cause I mean, yep. that's, a, that's a huge thing to remember is, yeah. Um, you know, everyone does the list differently. The guidelines are different. The requirements are different. I don't, we don't review over at Smoking Tobacco. So ours is not review based. Uh, yep. It's more voted upon internally. Um, things could change, you know, in the next year or so with that. But for now, that, that's just how we did it this year. Yep. We wanted to yep. get it going. Um, you know, but everyone does it differently. Um, really interested for the half-wheel consensus. Mm-hmm. We were just kind of talking about that before the show. I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, so far, Underground 10's got a lot of points for that, um, making the top of the consensus right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was saying I think they may have with, with now this. And Boston Jimmy gave them a number one for a large – company cigar of the year last night so that's another number one that's typically been used uh on the consensus they kind of he has like three lists so he they kind of prorate it a bit but it's going to get points for that and we have actually studied the half of consensus a lot like we do a, like data analysis on it on, on shows and we usually are pretty close to what we think is going to be at the top and, and i think underground 10 and Alec, Brad, Alec and Bradley can sue you the two I'm looking at right now that are showing up on enough lists where that could get them the points they need. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you one that I'm surprised I haven't seen um, more number ones or just a lot more is Rocky Patel 60. It, was, really a late, thought... it was a late release was the problem. True. Well, yeah, that, I think that's because, look – I didn't even include it, but it's it was it's not it would have been eligible with past the deadline. But then again, I've this is what's funny, Matt. 
I've seen a couple of cigars come out in the month of December that land on lists. And that's where I scratched my head. I'm like, did you smoke the Rocky 60? Did, because that's, that's probably one of the best cigars come out of the trade show. Yep. And I agree. you, it was, it was three on your list, right? Yes. It was number I, three. Yeah. It, I said, it won't be on my list this year, but don't be surprised next year. It will be on it um, for sure. So I am surprised on that cons- considering the year Rocky's had which has been, I think, the best year he's had of his career. Yeah, I mean, not to mention the fact that, you know, All Saints St. Francis is also made um, at Rocky Patel as well. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah, and, you know, that's a good point to make. So, I mean, you have two cigars right there that are, um, you know, technically coming out of the Rocky factory, even if one of them's not Rocky, but comes out of that factory. You know, the 60 is also, you know, I think a very good cigar. Like I said, I gave it number three. Um the top three spots were, were pretty tough. I thought they were all really good, but um, I would thought that was going to, I originally I thought that might be your number one. Really? The only thing I was wondering is it came out late in the year. Mm-hmm. So, and I, and I, I'm just, I'm just hesitant to put, which it did, me. it did take, that did impact its placement yeah. too. Yeah. Because I'm hesitant because I don't, that cigar could change. It could go up or down compared to a cigar released in January. So right. that's why I'm hesitant. I'm not saying you did a wrong thing, but I get hesitant on that because I've seen it happen. Mm-hmm. So what yeah, I mean, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say, um, well, actually, I'm going to change topics. So I'll let you say your thought first because okay. then I'm going to go into yeah. something else. Yeah, a really good example was the Camacho American Barrel Age came out a few years ago. Oh, yes. Yep. And if I had done it, like when it came out, if I had done the list like the month it came out, it probably would have been top 10. It ended up finishing number 29. So mm-hmm. because as time went on, it kind of went down. Um, so, you know, it's just one of those things that uh, cigars change over time. That's kind of what I try to do with my list, at least, is evaluate that change and try it. And that's why I have to have some crazy scheduling things and eligibility things. But that's the only way I can do it. Um, let me ask you. So actually, I, I thought of something. Um, while you were saying that, something different. But I'll bring, uh, so I want to bring this up first. As an example, Ferry Otago, right? Launched very late in the year. Yep. Um, possible, maybe we see the Ferry Otago um, lines themselves maybe end up on less next year. I think How- it's a possibility. I think it's a possibility. They were limited releases too, which made it a little more difficult. Mm-hmm. And they weren't cheap. Um, no, they weren't. They were weren't. twenty-one dollars a stick. Yeah, I haven't. Re- I have them. I haven't reviewed them yet. Uh, and it was like I said, they'll be tw- they were twenty-two to to begin with. I actually thought that Ferry Tego would be a consensus favorite at the time it was announced. Um, but I think the cigars turned were more expensive and they were more limited, and they came out later in the year. And that I don't think it's going to be on the consensus at all. That could change next year. So let me ask you this now. The timeless brand that was already an existing brand. Do we see that now make its second round through list next year because no, it's new? They won't. And I do the air quotes. Yeah, I don't think you will. Uh, on the online media, no. On the print media, yes. Uh, aficionado has always been high on the timeless brand. Both the Dominican and the Nicaraguan one. So right. I think aficionado will know the story. Yeah. That's tr- and print versus online is definitely different. Kind of it, like it, it is very different. Yeah. yeah. It, so it, we we could have a very weird thing happen with the consensus this year. In that th- this w- we're actually wondering if there's gonna be an unreleased cigar that makes the consensus top twenty five this year. And that's Paladin de Saka. It's showing up on lists even though it it hasn't arrived at stores yet. So I actually, this was going to be what I was going, going to segue yeah. into Yeah, um, was this topic because it was something that I picked up on very early and I continued to see stuff happen. Right. And I'm like, yeah, for example, Cigar and Spirits magazine, they listed the Liga Pravada H99 uh, number 11 on their list, mm-hmm. which is fine. And, you know, it doesn't mean that it's a bad cigar, but what I thought was interesting was 
it's a very limited cigar, which even Drew Estate has publicly said, like, it's really not fully launched because we don't have enough for that. So, like, they some were released. They were done through events and stuff like that. People were able to get them, but they haven't really fully rolled that brand out because they're still trying to get um, production on it going. Yep, yep. And there's just it's just not a lot of it. And that's why they did their their virtual events where you could get a chance to win a box or buy the box, or whatever. Um, Cause they only had so many, so they tried to divvy them up. So it was kind of fair or whatever. Right. So to see that make the list, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess technically it was available for sale and whatnot, but to see a cigar so limitedly available, um, it just, I don't know. It kind of raised my eyebrow a little bit because, and again, the lists get put together the way they get put together and everyone does it different. But at the end of the day, I think what some people need to remember is some portion or function or purpose to the lists that we all do, it's to let people know like what we think is great and we rank them. And when people read that list to see like, oh, what's hot? What am I going to buy? At the end of the day, that's a huge part of it. I'm not going to say that's all of it. But that's a huge part of it. It's maybe the major part of it is like, hey, these are what we thought were the greatest ones. And people read that are going to go, oh, I got to go find those. So you see cigars like that on the list and you're gonna be like, oh, wow, that was, you know, whatever. It was a number 11 or if something got ranked higher, like it's in the top 10. Oh, this was in the top 10. Let me go find it. And you go to all your stores and you can't get it because it's really not available. So it's kind of a little discouraging for the consumers because then they're going to see stuff that they just, they can't get. Um, not that it hasn't happened before. And I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, make a whole case out of it. It's just something I saw that I thought was interesting. Uh, and I and I know I wanted to get your thoughts on that too. Yeah, so H99 is an interesting case because the cigar it was launched in 2018. There was like a small release a few months later, and then we didn't really see it again till this year. Um, and it was like an event only cigar, right? So there's two schools of thought that people subscribe to when doing these lists. It's hey, these are the best cigars I smoked or the media entity has smoked or you know what these are the best cigars that have been released uh in a, in a period of time i tend to subscribe to the latter i use a two-year window and say these are the best performing cigars uh so i exclude something that is only sold through an event i mean it's basically it could be a limited release it could be a small batch release but it's gotta it's gotta be available on a retail shelf and on a nationwide basis uh, so there's no store exclusives, no regionals. It's, it's got to be nationwide. And if you're a small batch, frank, quite frankly, you're not going to get the uh, benefit of the doubt. If, so if it's like a 300 box release, you're not going to. It's just it, the way I do it. It's just the cigars that are basically scoring right around that same range. You're going to get the advantage because you can't get because the number one question I get, Matt, for a review is where, when, and where can I get these cigars. And it's the same thing when you put out like a, a list. That's the questions I start getting. Um, this Paladin and the socket thing is just ridiculous. All right. Yeah. It's and I'm sorry, Steve. I know Steve's not happy about hearing this. A cigar needs to be on the shelf to be considered for a cigar of the year. You can't. You know. I mean, is is are we? You know. And, and media guys who are doing this. Is it amateur? Are we doing amateur hour? Or are you trying? I mean, that, that's my question. If you want to be amateur hour, that's fine. But but then I, I see people put them on the list and 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 then they're the ones who want like, you know, they want all the benefits of being in media. I just think I understand it's your list and you can do what you want. I never would change that. But I think you have a responsibility of stewardship, right, to kind of put out a list that makes some sense. And hey, save Paladin's Masaka for next year if it's that good. Right. I have no, I have no problem with that. Uh, like the H ninety nine was very limited. I, I just don't think it belongs on a, on a cigar and spirits list either. I don't understand how they do their list either. It's okay. They decide what they, it's about what they smoked over the past year. But here's the thing: when you go put H ninety nine on the list, okay, something that you smoked probably was excluded because you decided you were gonna go forward with the H ninety nine. That could have been, and we were just asking, why isn't Rocky 60 on? And I don't know if Rocky 60 was on that list, but I'm just saying, I'm using that as an example. Mm -hmm. If you decide to put a Paladin de Saka on there and you didn't smoke the Rocky 60 that's out already, shame on you. 
Shame on you for doing that. Yeah, so if Rocky Patel 60 was on that list, it was rated number 10. Okay, so that was a bad example. Mm-hmm. All right. But I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll go with like Boston Jimmy's list, who did have Paladin to soccer. And by the way, Boston Jimmy, love the guy, great guy. Um, there's probably something he didn't smoke. And Paladin to soccer got smoked and may have, may have, may have cost that cigar being on the list. That, that's kind of where I'm going. With. That's where I have a problem with that. Because you can't smoke everything, is what I'm saying. Yeah, and that's true. Uh, you made a lot of good points there. Um, and again, I, I, I would preface this with, I, I don't, I'm, I don't want to say anyone's wrong for no, putting and I, like cigars said, either. But I'm just saying that's my opinion. Right, right. No, I know. And, and I just wanted to enforce that too. Um, like for me, I would wait until like H99 was a little bit more available. And yeah. then I would happily like, like, you know, entertain it for the list. Yeah. Um, it's just for me, like it was hard. And I had some other stuff on the list um, before the whole thing went public. Stuff that we put on as I was going through, trying to whittle it down to the 25. You know, there was one on there that I was like, you know what? That's super limited. And I'm like, I don't want I don't want it on the list at all because I don't want to put out a list and name something for someone to go look for that they're not going to be able to find or be right. difficult to find. So right. I did take the I did take that cigar off. Now, if in the future it becomes more available, absolutely it would you sure. know sure absolutely at that point I would entertain letting it have a second chance on the list because now in, in my book it's just more widely available. So now it is kind of it's ready to be going onto the list, even, even though it might already like H99 came out a few years ago, right? For me, that cigar is still eligible to go on my list once it's a little bit more widely available. Um, and that's the only reason why like certain stuff like that I would leave off just because I want to try to put together a list that people can um, sm- actually really smoke or most people can smoke through. Right. So yeah, um, that's that's just kind of how I feel about it. Um, but again, not that any of those cigars are bad. They don't deserve to be there. No, they, it's not. saying that, Yeah. And I think they just do at the right time. And it could even be that Steve gave those cigars to some people in the media from the back he's shipping, right? Mm-hmm. That's and that's totally fine. But if you can't get it, what what's the point, right? And then there's the, there's another case, okay, where this is go. A lot of us remember this: the Matt Boos, one of his early trade shows, the original Room One Hundred One. We were at Matt. We were smoking those cigars with Matt in 2010. Oh my goodness, we thought this was the greatest thing to come out. Like this was gonna be the next the next great cigar. We were all in love with that room 101. It hit the shelves, it was nothing the same. And by the way, Matt will tell you that. It was horrible. Right? So, but that's what happens. That's why we're all a lot of us who've been around for a while were gun shy on, on anything unreleased because it, it could change and people can't get it. If you want, like I said, if you want to just be a listen, hey, this is what I smoked, that's fine. I also think that Charlie, with the consensus, which I think he's done a very good job with it, mm-hmm. that's something he needs to look at. If, if, this, if this shows up on the list, do you, like on uh, the top 25, do you include it? My, my guess is he's going to include it, just so you know. But I don't mm-hmm. think he should. That's, but it's his list. It, it's he, he's, he's the curator of that, not me. That's his decision to make it, but he leaves himself open to the criticism on that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and, and, every, and everyone's open to criticism, no matter what the list looks like, too. Oh, that's the best. I, I love that part. That's the best part of is that when I get these emails from consumers and from industry people. And the best one I get it from people who work for the company saying, how come my cigars aren't on the list? That's my favorite. Oh, I love those. And, yeah. and now I'm starting to get them as we're getting down into the into the gritty stuff right now. And I said, there's two reasons. You didn't meet the criteria. Your cigar wasn't good enough. They go, which was it? I said, you want me to tell you? <laughs> you figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, not everyone can be so straightforward and honest as honest Abe, who um, I do uh, I do hope is doing well. I hope he's doing well too. Yes, I, uh, uh, he he was supposed to be on smoking tobacco this week. Uh, unfortunately, we have to reschedule it to Tuesday. Um, and John jumped in. We did a little end of the year show yeah, instead. Yeah, it was good to but, see John. Yeah, yeah, no, it was great. You know, uh, he he's he's been busy doing stuff, but it was really great to have him back on. It kind yeah. of just felt like old times again. Um, I always I always like when he comes on. I just wish I milked more of it. I wish I, I made more of a, a milking effort to get that soap review. We brought it up once and I could have really egged him on for it, but I didn't. Um, but no, I mean, it was great. And we're going to see Abe on Tuesday. We'll yeah. be talking a lot about the great smoke. He has some things that he's going to announce. So, 
and I don't want to give any of it away. Just make sure you watch that show on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern because he is going to he's going to announce something regarding the great smoke that you're going to want to hear. So well, what is it? I'm not going to tell you. Well, well you know I'll, what it, I'll tell I, you, but I'm not telling I, I'm, you. Right okay, here. okay, okay. Just, <laughs> I'll tell you, but balls. not now. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to leak it out. I'm busting bust balls. I'm busting balls. It's all good. What is it you always say? Rumor free, teaser free. That's why I just say come out and say it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, it's it's just not my place to say. I'm gonna build up the hype for the show, you know. Of course, I get it. I get it. Yeah. But uh, no, he, he he's gonna be announced on the, on the show, um, and I believe uh, the goat will be there too. Alex Tavella will be on the show as well. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. So things regarding the Great Smoke, questions, comments, and concerns, definitely right. make sure you're there because they will right. both be there, and uh, hopefully they can answer them or help your right. problems in real time. Yeah. So uh, just don't want to stress that enough. Don't miss that show. Um, cause if you're a great smoke goer, you're going to want to hear that. So, um, yeah, no, I mean the lists, they've just been, um, they have been fun though. Like they I have. said, and for the most part, for the most part, they've been pretty good. There's a few lists I saw that I just, I didn't, I wasn't like, wow, like what the hell is this? But I was just kind of like, that's peculiar. They've been, they've been bad this year. Um, I, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna. I'm gonna come out and say the list. Of, the list could be, and it's not because of the cigars on the list. It's. It's. I don't know. They just the way these things are put together. There's like no effort sometimes. Do you think all of the lists are bad or no? There's a chunk of them. Yours was good. I mean, there's, there's a lot. Look, there are a lot of good ones too. But I've seen a lot of garbage out there this year. Hmm. And hmm. and here's my number one thing is I'm like, I don't be, like when you say I don't believe in list. There's a lot of these I'm seeing out there. I don't believe in doing lists, but I'm gonna do a list anyway. Stop it. You, if you don't say, you know, do it. Just do your list and don't tell me, you know. Look, if you don't believe in doing a the list, time, if, then what are you if doing? If you don't believe in doing a list, don't do a list. Then, then stand by what you're saying. But uh, no, I mean, there have not, there's been some, there's been, you know, there's a couple of lists I saw on YouTube that are actually pretty good. Um, and vice versa. Yeah, people think I'm anti YouTube. No, there was some YouTube lists I saw that were really good. And there's some print media lists uh, or online media lists I thought were substandard in my book. So, uh, smoking tobacco this was excellent, so no worries there. I you don't have to be nice. You mean you could tell I didn't me. agree. I didn't agree with I didn't agree with every pick, but but no, I thought the list Here was put comes. together very Here well. It comes. No, I thought the list was put together. <laughs> no, it, it's you don't agree with every I, I don't expect you to agree with every cigar I have on my list either. No, yeah, no, I know. That that it's not about I never have a problem with that. It's more of like I tend to see people like they, they smoke a they smoke one or two brands and then they're all it's like their brand their list is like four brands total you know it's like th- those are like that's why i'm just like i don't understand it you know um, and one one of the things i tried to do with my list too is try to make sure that i did not forget or leave out the brands that i don't personally regularly smoke because that i don't want that to be like an impact because that wouldn't really be fair yeah. so i made sure to to track down, follow certain cigars that would be eligible and try to get to as many of those as I could and give them a fair shot and not really kind of smoke them with my own mentality of just like, oh, this is like what I like to smoke, just in more of a general, like, okay, personal feelings aside on stuff and like, how does this one smoke? How does it perform? How are other people going to think? So not so much like a, this is my like fan favorite list. Right. Um, not that I'm like calling out anyone for doing that. I'm just saying yeah. um, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I really covered everybody because then we'll leave anyone out and then someone go, well, you don't, you know, that's because you don't, you never smoked that brand. Yeah. So that's why you didn't put it on the list. So, um, cause that's, that's not good for anybody. So that's <clears throat> cause my list is different. Your list is done off of reviews right. and stuff like that. And you kind of review almost everything. Yeah. Um, or you try to uh, yeah. versus me it was more of a i wasn't going off of that so i kind of think a little bit more outside yeah. the box with my parameters on that yeah so so a good example of that matt is i love i love erica thompson's cigar dojo list mm-hmm. the issue i have with it is he's a review site and there's cigars that aren't reviewed that make that list i think if you're a review site you need to stick to the cigars you review because i think it opens up pandora's box um if you don't, so I think it's gotta be one like Bear doesn't review cigars on his and he does his own list. You don't, so I'm fine with that. Um, 
but I do think like if I put a cigar, here's a great example, man. I could put a cigar on the list, let's say, and it's like number three cigar of the year. And if I haven't reviewed it, then what happens when I go back and review it and that cigar sucks? <laughs> that's that's the problem. Yeah. And I've seen I've seen this happen with some lists. Um, so that's why I'm very if you're a review site, stick to the reviews is what I'm saying. You were a little bit of a different situation. You had some reviews out from Nelson, but I don't think it I don't think again that it was a small amount. So it didn't offset the um I still think you did it the right way. Yeah, it, it wasn't was enough that would have yeah, no. It was the same with Ben with 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 smoking syndicate and he's using different criteria. Like he he's totally independent how he reviews. That's a standalone because like we want that to be a standalone brand and it's Ben's brand and vision. So, uh, but he didn't do a list either uh, because he didn't have enough cigars this year on it. So, so I mean, it, it's that's what it comes down to pretty much is I think if you review cigars, then base it on your reviews. Um, and if you don't, then don't. Yeah, I mean, all good points. Um, you know, as I said for myself, you know, for now, we're not doing reviews. That That could be changing though. So then could, all of a sudden it, it we get, yeah. we would get more into a different place, similar to, to the way the coupe list goes. Yeah. Um, but until that happens, you know, it, it'll stay this way for now. Um, but, you know, getting away from the list thing, because I don't want to like dive too deep into it. We can maybe circle back to it later. Yep. Um, what else did you have on your list for the show today? Um. So let's see what couple, Coop's B for the week is. Let, let's go with the B for the week. Um, because <laughs> uh, this one I didn't even tell you about. Okay, so it comes from Saka. And oh, I know what this. I know what this is. You don't even have to say anything else. Okay. <laughs> well, no, go ahead. But I just I know where you're going with this. The price increases. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and Steve's completely off base on this one. I'm sorry, Steve. You're you're as far off base on this as possible. Um. That's all I can say. So basically, he is increasing prices and kind of turned this thing around on the media about the whole thing, about the price increases. Like the mm -hmm. media is not telling the real story kind of deal. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and here's why I'm raising prices. I'm not just doing this. right. And, and here's the thing. First of all, I agree. Steve is not raising prices willy-nilly. There are business reasons why he's raising prices. There are business reasons why every other thing is raising prices. Steve, the problem is there's only one media sites that's covering price increases it's half wheel mm -hmm. and by the way they're doing a great job at it right they don't because they don't editorialize it they say this is the price increases and this is going up so to complain that the story is being not told or misrepresented by the media is is baloney because first of all companies aren't banging on my door to tell me about price increases right i think there were maybe three or four i've gotten this year there were two you probably got the same two i got this week mickey peg Right, is having a price increase. Yep. Yep. And Gurkha's holding prices. Yep. So that's all I covered this week, right? Because basically, these articles on in the coop world, they don't get a lot of traffic, right? People who are, now half wheel, they they they'll they'll call up every manufacturer and ask them a price. And I know it's for a fact because the manufacturers call me saying, "Do you want the price increase stuff?" Because they just call me for it, right? It's the ones I really know. And I said, "Well, if you want to send it to me, that's fine." If you don't want to send it to me, it's fine because it's not a big deal. But if you send it to me, I'll, I'll put it up there. So we're not getting this stuff. We're not getting the price increases, Steve. No, I don't. Who's talking about like that manufacturers are, are raising prices for greed? I, I haven't heard this argument from, from anybody. And, and it's a, so that's the beef I have with Steve. I get it if someone said Steve's raising prices because he's greedy, right? No, I, I, I haven't heard that, right? And oh, by the way, Steve, you didn't send your price increases to the media. You sent it to retailers first, and then you put something up on Facebook. So, and I know that. So you don't have to say that you you didn't even bother to send it to the media to begin with. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, and I agree with a lot of the same points too. And you know, it, look, it's one of those things that if a, if we get the information, it's nice. We'll put it out, but yeah. we're not really chasing it down. Um, it's not something that I think a lot of people really, it's one of those, it's one of those announcements that not like, I mean, it's good to know. I mean, yeah. like, Oh shit. Like they're going to go up, but like, um, or like, Oh, it's not going up or whatever. Um, you know, but 
I, I, I think, like you said, it, it's not it's not like the hottest item. Right. So there's no reason for us to really go chase it down. Yeah. Half wheel does, but the half wheel is a little bit different. And I would say that half wheel being um, kind of where they are and kind of. I agree. Yeah. It's more, and they're more, they're more catering to the industry folks. I mean, technically they cater to everybody, yeah. but a lot of, a lot of stuff they do is catered more so just for industry people. Yeah. Um, where the average consumer might really just not care. Um, yeah. but the rest of us are like, oh, hey, we see something come up. We're like, yeah. oh, that's cool. Um, and, and so to a degree, it serves a purpose. Right. But I think that's kind of where the rest of us are a little bit different from Half Wheel, just yeah. because you know they're going to take the time to find that information and, and to get it out for everyone to right. know. But their target audience is a little different than the rest of us, and I think you would agree with that. Yep. So let me give you a great example of this, right? And it's a lot of work what they do with these price, this so this price coverage. I wanted to say it's it's not as easy as it sounds. So because they're first of all they're not they're not getting sent it. They're having to call people, and a lot of times basically what happens is it's not really a press release. There's an email that goes out, and here's the new prices, right? Well, guess what? Doesn't the next step is you have to figure out what the old prices were, right? So that's work yep. to kind of now go ahead and do that research into you have to call, make company calls, or you have to do research. It's not easy to do that, right? And like I said, this I said I commented on Steve's post: the juice ain't worth the squeeze, at least from what I'm seeing. Mm-hmm. So. No, it's not that. Yeah, so it's not something I want. Like I said, if a company wants to send me that information, uh, I'll gladly print it, provided I have all the information there. But um, if not, then then don't. <laughs> it's a, it's not really something I'm going to get upset about. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with that, too. I think that that's a, um, it's a really good point. And yeah. like I said, I feel the same way. It, it's it's not something that's really worth chasing down or putting a lot of other work. Yeah. There's other things that, you know, we could be yeah. putting out yeah. and stuff yeah. rather than, than chase, like you said, chasing down all the old prices yeah. and the new prices. and Right. And, and here's the thing that I'll say is, um, I, like I said, I haven't heard people really complaining about the price increases, uh, not in the media, at least. Mm-hmm. If anything, people in the media have been saying that I've been talking the same, you know, what? it's inflation right now. Yeah, the scar industry is going to have to take their lumps with some of the inflation here right now. And I think a lot of people anticipated price yeah, increases I think they, too. Yeah, I don't think it's a shock. Like, oh wow, they're going up. Like, yeah, everything is going up. Yeah, even not, you don't even have to be in the industry to know that. It just you right, go to the so, grocery store and the price of meat is three times as it was like a year and a half ago. Like, yeah, things right. are up. <laughs> if this was four <laughs> years ago or something, where we didn't have these type of economic factors, and someone, st- you know, if, if Steve wants to question it, then you know. If someone questioned Steve on that, I'd be completely uh, understanding. Like th- that's, but this is an inflation thing, and in most cases, these how are keeping up with the price of the, the inflation rate. Yeah, and I think it's only going to continue to go even higher. Um, to be honest, I mean, at least somewhat dramatically for the somewhat foreseeable future, because you know the economy is all like one big bag, you know half of it goes up the rest of it's going up i mean it's all relative right so i mean and just from what we know about the industry what happened in the last few years i mean the demand is through the roof right now factories are mostly at back at full capacity you know john was saying lfd's back at full capacity they they ramped up their their uh, their rolling school so they could uh teach more people to roll and, and get more people rolling um you know but there's there's so many other factors that, that a lot of people yeah. are behind and that's going to take them, you know, time and money to try to keep up with the demand or even just get caught up or whatever. And then you just have the general rising cost of materials because of the inflation. So all of it kind of goes together. It's all stuff we've known about. We've known about this all year. We've been, ta- we've been talking about this since last year, to be honest with you. Yeah. So it's not like it's anything new. In oh, terms of anything. cigar price increases, right. it's, it's all like, in fact, yeah. if a lot of people came back and said, we're not, I'd be like, really? Yeah. I'd be right. shocked. I'd be shocked too. I mean, and by the way, if someone is criticizing Steve, I'd like to know who it is. I would love to like critique that. Um, and Steve, if someone has critiqued you, make it known. But I haven't, like I said, I follow a lot of this stuff. As you and I follow a lot of this stuff, I haven't seen it. Let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. This came. We had this debate a couple of years ago on on prime time. 
should they be communicating the price increases to the media? This should a, they? Should the media be informed when the retailers are informed? I don't see why not. I don't see why not either. Yeah. Um, listen, I mean, at I, that point, it's public knowledge. I, I don't under, like, I don't see, but it's never, it never happens like that because, right. Well, like I could tell you that, you know, some companies do it, but very few, most of them, they send it to the retailers only. Right. And they don't, like I said, so they don't, um, it's just as easy to put your media partners on that email distribution list. Right. So, so it's a deliberately not. And I've been told in some cases that they don't want the media doing that. They want to communicate it to their retailers and then have the retailers communicate it to their customers. So I used to be on the side of why do companies not do that? But I guess as I'm learning more, I kind of understand it that, you know, I think you want your retailers to know first on pricing, on pricing stuff. I get that. You don't want them to be surprised. I get it, right? But then you have like, see, this is where it gets, this is where I see customers get upset. Like there's these, there are people like, they engage with their customers on social media, right? So cigar industry is very unique. Like you can engage with the owners of your company, right? And they'll tell you stuff. They'll share stuff with you online. But when it comes to pricing, they don't, right? And that's where I think it gets a little tricky because now suddenly is, you know, well, we, we got to share it with our retailers first, you know? You know, and then you have tax implications and stuff like that. So it, it is a little tricky. I, I, I get it why it's done. I still, as a media person, even if I'm not publishing a price increase, I want to know what, what cigars cost. I want to know what the MSR, if you're updating your MSRPs, I'd like to know it and have it on my records uh, because I do put prices of cigars and reviews and, uh, you know, it, may, it makes some sense, you know, as, as I'm a consumer. So uh, I shouldn't have to read about it on half wheel or figure it out is what I'm saying. So I think there's some benefit to telling the media. Maybe if you want to send it to your retailers a day in advance, I understand that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, we had a comment from our good friend Mark in the chat tonight. Uh huh. <laughs> very, very interesting. Um, maybe some of them should fix their quality control issues before they raise prices. That's another issue. Yeah, I mm. know, Mark. It's a fair argument. Um, mm. Good point. And you got to remember, some of these companies, it's not their fault because they're contracting to factories so and, and other companies. Keep that in mind um that's a problem so if you're you may if the factory raises your price you know but there's a quality control there's a quality issue with cigars this year it's not quite if you're telling me this is the best year ever for cigars you need to have your head examined because this was not the best year no i wouldn't say it was the best year um there was a lot of stuff so i think it was fun but i don't think it was you know the best because you you saw a lot of stuff just being put out there to, to get out there um you know and there's definitely some manufacturers struggling with that still um, yeah look at lft you know they're they're cranking away as hard as they can to just to keep up with this whole situation and to kind of get out of a little bit of a hole that they're in you know you go to a lot of shops and you don't see a lot of lft yeah and then what, what, what i actually see is like I'll, I'll go around to some shops. I don't see a lot of it. And then all of a sudden you go on social media and then shops are posting like that. They got some in um, and they got like some bulls and like some, some like 700 Maduros, some diggers, more popular stuff. Um, and you're seeing people, I, I see, I know a few retailers who they get some of that stuff in and then they, they get some of the other LFD stuff in that's not so notorious. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing people trying to sell the popular boxes with the purchase of a not so popular box to sell both. Yep. Um, but with LFD, I mean, it's also limited right now that it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I would say it's kind of all desirable at this point. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that they have that is, is just not on shelves right now. And, and a lot of it's still good stuff. It may not be like Andalusian Bowl, right? That's right. the big one. This, all of a sudden you see, oh, we have Andalusian Bull. Oh, and I know and Andalusian Bull is special, but then you'll see, be like, well, you got to buy like, you know, DL 300s, you know, in order to get like a box of Andalusian Bull. I've seen this and I'm, I don't like it. I, I don't like when retailers do that. What's your take on that? I don't like it. I think it's just, you know, we, I don't like when retailers force you to buy something to buy the Andalusian Bulls. 
And I've had discussions with retailers I know very well and close with on that. You know? Uh, I understand. I, get, I, I, I see both sides of it. If I'll say a, that. Then just put it at an event. Don't put it on the shelf every day with that. Uh, I, How do I know you... Yeah. So, all right, let me, let me turn this around for you, okay? Uh-huh. Or I'll say it differently. Okay. And it's not just LFD with the bowl. I mean, you got right. Opus, there's, there's some Liga stuff. There's other brands that make stuff that's not regularly right. coming in. So right. as a blanket for all of those, in terms of retailers, not the manufacturers, because they once they send it out, I mean, they send it out, retailers right. do what they want. So for the retailers, do you feel that re- – how do you feel – let me ask you this way. How do you feel retailers should handle their really limited edition stuff when it comes in? Do you think that it should just be broken down for singles so that everyone gets a chance to have one? Do you think that it, they should save everything for an event and then just try to blow it all out in an event to make the event special? Um, do you think that they should have like a list system where, you know, people just, they get called off a list. There's so many different ways, or, or even like the bait and switch kind of thing. I hate to put it that way, but like, you know, you get one good box, but you got to buy this box too. Um, there, there's several different ways that retailers handle that stuff. So I'm curious what your feeling is on what you think the best method of handling those products is. I would say the event way is the first way I would go. Uh, I understand this way it's an event and you can kind of feed into the whole concept of the event. Um, that would be the first way. The second way would be a limit of one per person. I think it's fair to do that. Okay. Um, I, I would go with those two options first. I don't like the list format. Um, I think that's a little unfair. Uh, ultimately, you're catering to one. You, you, you're not helping grow your customer base doing that. Um, so I don't really like that. I know it goes on. Look, I know for a fact that there's Opus X's that retailers they get one or two boxes and they don't hit the shelves they buy them for themselves you know yeah so i'm like i'm not a big fan of fuente's approach with that sometimes um it's just why i know i don't know if they, i don't have a better answer unfortunately if they only have so much tobacco so it's hard to beat up them but unfortunately i don't know if there's contractual things that say you have to put those on the shelf or something like that Mm-hmm. But I have seen, I mean, you and I have probably both know that um, these Opus X's, they never make it to the shelf. And we know someone who, like, they, you know, where we can buy them that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't really looking for. You know, here's another one, uh, Matt. Yeah. Like, and I'm not, do a Jay Davis, uh, like what he did with Aladino Aligantes. You buy them and, and, oh, by the way, there's a contribution going to CRA or something like that. There's a there's a really creative way you could give back to the industry that way. You don't have to, you know because you don't have to get greedy on a one or two box allocation, right? Right. You could you could just simply say, hey, you know what, you, you buy these, you're gonna pay a little more for them, but we're gonna donate this amount of money to this to CRA or to charity or something like that. Um, um, Jeff did I know Jeff did it with the rare pinks with, with he did a charity angle with it. Um and I said Jay Davis, I know with the uh Aladino, Cameron Aligantes, he had a donation, uh, I believe it was to CRA. So, I mean, there's things you could do like that. Um, I don't think you have to just say force someone to buy a box. That's a greed, that's a greed tactic. Uh, and, and you shouldn't need to do that. If, you, you, if that's the way you have to move it, then you're not moving product right. So, uh, Chad Manson, I quit buying like that. I'm not buying any more boxes of anything to get something special too many other cigars to buy anyway I, I agree. Uh, or you a big you. sampler of nothing special to get one rare stick uh dan thompson says i believe retailers have to make decisions based on their customers there is no one size fits all i think that's kind of true too yeah, I every, agree. every shop has its own demographics right, right? and they have their own ecosystem right. yep. of the way of who their customers are how they buy what they buy right. when right. they come in that's definitely true too not not the way that Jeff is going to run Sand Lake is not right. going to be the same way that, you know, Kurt runs Twins or that, you know, yep. one of the Tinder yep. boxes, you know, down in the Carolinas, they're, they're going to operate. You know what yep. I mean? They're all going to be different. I took a fair point. Um, and I, I think it's a good point as well. Um, you know, you can't, it's, it's every retail store very much has to cater to their customer base. And you can even in the same locale have very different customer bases. That's a good point. Yeah. 
So, I mean, again, it, it kind of depends. And sometimes you go into certain stores and you see the certain brands that are more prevalent and it's probably usually based on what they sell, right? So <clears throat> you're going to carry more of and you're going to push more money into carrying inventory of stuff that sells more based on who is buying from you. So, you know, you go into a store that's a huge Fuente store and they have a lot of Fuente stuff. It's probably a lot of Fuente buyers there. You go into a store that's, they got a lot of Espinosa. They have a huge Espinosa clientele, you know, and maybe their Fuente, um, maybe they don't have as many Fuente customers, you know, and then they're going to go into a store that's got a lot of Drew State, all the Drew State lines from Liga, Undercrown, um, Deadwood, um, you know, just Acid, all of it, just all, all the different stuff that they make. And they have a huge Drew Estate population there. Yep. And then maybe they don't sell a lot of Ashton, but then the store across the street, maybe they sell a lot of Ashton and they don't really sell any Drew Estate. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, that, there's a lot of truth to that too. Every store is going to have its its specifics yeah. within its yeah. clientele. So I think when certain brands that have stuff like that come into certain stores, it probably does get handled differently. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I'm okay with that being as an event only because, hey, you want people to attend the event. So uh, you're getting other deals at the event. So I'm, I'm okay with it as an event. It's just in the everyday shelf thing. I think that's kind of, you know, cheesy. Or you, you know, cheesy. I think you got it. You know, I, I just don't like that. There was, um, there's a, a little news announcement that came out earlier this week, and I wanted to bring it up. I wanted to get your, your thoughts on it. I thought it okay. was very unique. We actually talked about this on the main show. Uh, Rocky Patel created a cigar to support New York retailers. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, you want the good and the bad? Both. That's why okay, we're so here. Let's look. Okay. So actually, um, this is not a new concept um, for New York. When I was starting out in 2011 and 2012, um, there were a, this was a big trend. It started with the Alec Bradley New York. I don't know if you remember that cigar. Uh, I, New- I don't remember that one. Yeah, it was a New York release. And then it went to national release. And then it was discontinued. It was a great cigar. Th- then there was the La Aurora Broadway uh, for New York only. And the Gurkha Para La Gente, which was a New York only cigar as well. Mm-hmm. And then there was the Monte Cristo, uh, the Monte Cristo New York edition. That yeah, was oh, yeah, one. I remember that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good so, cigar. So, so they've done that. And I think it was great that they brought this back this year. Um, and I'm great to see that Rocky Patel did this. How did you find out about this story, Matt? Uh, I believe I saw this on Hot Wheel. There you go. What what the what the hell is the NYTA doing, man? Why are you why are you not promoting this and calling media or getting people putting this on social media or something? I'm 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 sure what happened is someone saw this cigar, half will got wind of it, and they called up the NYTA or Rocky Patel. Look, if you want to promote a cigar for New York. Promote this cigar for New York. This should have been sent to every media person. Somehow it should have been communicated. If you don't have the email people's address, go on social media and do this type of stuff. Do a push that way. But we should have to find out about this from Half Wheel. And if you're going to try to support New York on it, you need to do a better job with that, the NYTA. I'm sorry. Would you say that in general, the... Um... All right, let's put it... I'm, gonna, I'm even going to... Go further. I just know, I looked at the board of the of the board of directors. These board of directors know better. They should yep. know better to push this out. So let me ask you this question: yeah. Do you think, yeah. and this this can include the big federal yeah. companies too, but yep. definitely all the state organizations? Do right. you think all organizations as a whole need to do a better job at promoting stuff to media? Yes. In this case, you just left money on the table to help your New York retailers by not promoting this. You could have done a – just think about if you had a 10 or 11 media outlets promoting this. It's on social media. Um, now I don't have a lot of interest in – I'll cover it if they ask me because it's for the benefit of the industry, right? But I, I'm not as really excited about it anymore because, like, like that's what you, you chose to give it to one media outlet who happened to maybe call you for it. Yeah. So – but, you know, it's, it's – it's Well, we've had, we've had discussions yeah. before where we've talked about um, – the media outreach yeah. from, I mean, this includes like PCA, CRA, CAA. Um, while they've gotten better, they could still be even better 
with their level of communication with with certain things they could, to yeah. media outlets and not even just stuff like this. Yeah. A lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. and I, by the way, I'm not going to hold the MITA totally accountable on this. I mean, was PCA and CRA told about this? This is a program. It's a great program. This mm. is a great thing. I mean, those New York cigars 10 years ago, I had people, I used to travel to New York a lot more, and people were asking me to pick up those cigars for them because they weren't easy to get online back then. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it really was, I mean, it just baffles me. It baffles me. You'd work on a project with Rocky Patel like this and then just basically just put it out there and hope that you're selling the cigars on the shelf. You should be pushing this right now. Yeah, I agree. I think that the idea is to help. So you want to get more people on board with it as you can. Um, make sure there's plenty of publicity. Uh, that's, yeah. there, there should definitely be more of that. I, I think, yeah, I think, like I said, and, and look, I, I, you know, I, like I said, I, I'm, I looked at the list of the retailers on there. A lot of them should know better. They, they really should. They really should. Um, we're gonna look at the, the people who are on, on the list of because there's some great retailers on there too. Um, but like I said, hey, you want to send me? Like I said, you want to send it to me? I'm, I think it's a great thing to promote. We did a. I said it was these. I think these. This is an exciting thing for New York, right? And it, and if it's going back to help the retailers, this is even. A, this is like a a win. And if this was sent to CRA and PCA, I can't say if it was. I don't know. If it wasn't, shame on them, right? And if it was, shame on our trade organizations for not promoting this like that. This should be. This is just a great. Because like I said, it. I saw what it did ten years ago, and I thought it was a really good program. Yeah. No. I. Um, it was my first thought of it when I saw it and read it. Was like, oh wow, that's great. Um, and you know, it'd be awesome to see more companies doing that you know, for retailers, yeah. not even just in New York. Well, yeah, New yeah. York, but there's, I mean, there's other areas too. Um, you know, it'd be nice to see that. So yeah. I think it's a great concept, but I think that I think more manufacturers should do it and there should be better coverage on that to get it out there more. The whole idea, I mean, it's almost like a fundraiser at that point. I mean, you want more people to buy into it. It's more money you raise to support the retailers. Right. So right. It, I think it needs more publicity. It, it, it does. Um, and like Whether said, or not you even live in that area too. I mean, back when these other cigars were announced that I all mentioned, they were all promoted very well with the media. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think the uh, Alec Bradley one actually got the, into aficionado. Um, so good job by them with that, um, you know, getting that. But, uh, yeah, you just want to oh, we'll just put it out on the shelves. You have to – your retailer is going to educate – then you got – look, your retailer should be educating people. Hey, you know what? This cigar, it's a great cigar we got from Rocky Patel. No, oh, by the way, this is what it's going to be. You need to do that, but I think you need to create awareness because you want to get people into the stores so then those conversations can be had. Absolutely. I think, yeah, yeah, I think that's what, what was important about that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Um, another interesting thing that kind of came across my desk this week that it caught my eye. Um, again, this was from Half Wheel as well, but it caught my eye. Um, fertilizer shortage means Cuba's tobacco crop will be smaller. I don't know if you saw this one. I've been hearing about this. Yes. Um, yes. This is, yeah, that's a very interesting one. I mean, Cuba's got some real tobacco shortage problems right now to begin with and production problems. So this is a big one to be, you know, look, if you, we, I was talking about this on Reinhold, Reinhardt's show. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. The, the shelves in the shelves in Europe of a lot of uh, the Sahabanos, they're empty right now, whether it's uh, the La Casa de Habanos, or some of the airport kiosks. Right. There's just no cigars in there right now. And this is not a good thing to hear. Was it, I think, because I was watching your Thursday night show when, when Pete was on there. Was it Pete who was telling the story about going to the airport? Yes. Duty free. Yeah. And he said yeah. he went in there and all they had on the shelf was like six boxes of like Hoy, um, Hoya de Monterey, like yeah. Lonsdales or something like that. Mm -hmm. And like nothing else. Um, but the exception, like they had hundreds of like, I think he said they, they had like all like the Cohiba cigarillos, but like in terms of like the big premium stuff, yep. there was like six boxes total. Um, so this is definitely a blow to Cuba who's already struggling Yeah. now <laughs> from what I understand, you know, so Habanos, so for those who don't know, Habanos 
recently, well, it was more Altadas because Altadas owned half of Habanos and they recently just sold that. Do you remember that story? Yeah, and basically now, yeah, it's, it's, um, and it, it's, it's still owned by the people who own Altadas, but there's just new owners now behind it. Or new, there's new, there's a new back financial backing group, I'll say, mm-hmm. is what's going on there. So and from the people str- I, well, I was yeah. going to say, because from the people I talk to on this, and what I'm hearing through the grapevine, um, that it was it was bought out, you know, so to speak, of this new financial backer um, is out of China. And that there's a huge drive to get more Cuban cigars into China. This is a, a huge demand for them there. Um, I don't know how much you know about that, or if you've heard that, or what you know on that. Um, I don't know. Mu- I'm gonna be. I don't know much about it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I must. I want to say I have heard of it. Um, but yeah, I have. I I can see that possibly being true. And but I don't. I don't have a lot to validate that on. Right. So let's let's just play the the hypothetical game, right? Let's say that's true. So uh-huh. you have a country like China, large population, um, uh, definitely a place where people are known for wanting you know, nice, luxurious things. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the people in the Chinese markets are always looking for higher end things, wanting Cuban cigars, wanting, you know, all of those top names that they make, right? So you're seeing a huge demand. Right. You want more of the Habano cigars come into China, right? Yep. Now, they're already struggling to keep up with world demand, which doesn't even include the United States, mind you. Right. And now you have, you know, China, who's like, well, we want a larger portion of the production here. So we can keep up with the demand here because we have an increasing demand for Cuban cigars here in China. Well, you're going to have stuff like that. That's going to bring down the quality because the Cuban cigar manufacturing system is just atrocious right now. Um, you add this onto it. That's not going to be great either. Yeah. So let's have the age old, let's have the age old debate while we're here. Right. Cause we're already, we're already in the realm. Hypothetical game, right? Tomorrow. The Cuban embargo ends. And everyone's happy-go-lucky, no hard feelings, and then things resume as they did before, you know, JFK when the embargo went into place, right? You see, Cuban cigars come to the United States. Do you think that kills the Cuban cigar market completely, because they won't be able to keep up with that demand? I don't or, know. or or in doing so, trying to, it just it completely brings them down all the way on their quality control that the cigars are just not even worth having. And then people just stop buying them and the Cuban cigar market just completely collapses. That's a good question. I mean, I could see it affecting the market for sure. And now there's, you know, the non-Cuban, you know, there's, there's a big push with companies now to try to compete with that shelf space that aren't Cuban. So, you know, and, you know, companies have had success with that. So I think there's some con- real concerns there. I don't know necessarily about, I think there's a collapse of the market. There's just too many people who don't follow this enough that will always want a Cuban cigar, mm-hmm. but it could affect the numbers for sure. I believe. Right. I mean, it's, they're already struggling. Do you think if the embargo ended, do you think that you would see more foreign money come into Cuba to help build up their infrastructure with their cigar making? Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe it would happen. And do you think that it would come from, existing manufacturers who want to add Cuban cigars to their lines? Or do you think maybe they just want to buy tobacco? So they're going to try to, you know, spend more money at least into to farming and, and growing of tobacco um, to, to then buy it and take it elsewhere to do whatever they want with it. Um, or do you think it'll be more in just people trying to just invest in all of it, but hoping to have some of their stuff made there? I mean, I guess, I don't know. I could go either way. I think I, I think go either way with that. For sure. I mean, I could definitely see China making that type of you know, investment, obviously. Which they still can at this point. Which they still can. Yeah. I mean, because there's can. no issue with them. They can still buy whatever. So now, if the they, embargo they ends, could. there's US money flowing there if the embargo ends, right? Yes. You, you know, and that, that would be the big if, if the embargo ends. I think you would see some US money in there. And uh, then do you think Cuban cigars you know, would hopefully start to kind of go back up to me, maybe their former glory? I'd like to think they go back up, and I know there may be differing opinions on that, uh, because you know, again, I look at what Nicaragua has done in the last twenty years, and how they've kind of really a lot's been invested in there. Um, take aside the past year, 
which is other circumstances. But, you know, there's, there's better fermentation techniques, better seed agronomy, you know. So ultimately, I think that there's no reason why that can't go to Cuba, which is kind of the uh, the sacred land on that, so to speak. I, I know people may disagree with that, but you know what I'm saying? There's no reason why that, that can't happen. And, you know, I tell you, I think that I've, I've talked to some very, very heavy hitters in the cigar industry that told me, hey, if Cuba opens up and the embargo is lifted um, and we, you know, they're in. They're in. So I've heard that from retailers, too. But I've also had a couple of retailers tell me if they are, if they do come in, at least right away in the beginning, unless it changes like we're talking hypothetical game. Yeah. Um, when they first come in, there's going to be a policy on them where yeah. they're not guaranteed. So if you buy a box and you have issues with it, there won't be any refunds on it. It'll be Cuban cigars are being sold as is because of the production issues with them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the big question I have is, will they actually start importing tobacco from other countries to make up for these tobacco shortages? It's true. That's something that's something worth watching, too. Right now, I'd say no, because there's no tobacco. If you heard Pete the other night and uh, heard some other folks uh, like Nick Perdomo was talking, there's, there's just no tobacco to be gotten right now. Right. So it's tough. Yeah, you you, you got into that a little bit with Pete because I watched most of that show um, talking about having a harder time, you know, for for manufacturers who buy tobacco from other farms yep. or in other areas and yep. other regions and whatnot. Um, it, it's gotten very hard to get certain tobacco in because it's just it doesn't exist. There's not enough to go around, shortages. Um, I know you got the you guys were talking about um the Connecticut broadleaf wasn't yep. a great wasn't a great crop year. So that's an yep. even smaller supply of you know Connecticut broadleaf tobaccos. They're they're being shipped around. So yeah, I mean it's not just Cuba. I mean, this is definitely everybody. Um yeah, yeah. yeah. So like I said, I, you're right. Like I said, I don't see that happening now, right? But yeah. If there's a surplus in a few years and Cuba is still struggling, if these problems really, I mean, affect Cuba, yeah. Um, and then, you know, the big question is even there's going to be a Habanos festival this year. Like they say, they said yes earlier in the year, and now there's rumors that they may not have it. So it's true, too. I know we don't talk rumors, but I'm just saying it's out there right now. Right. I'm not saying Which that's normally what, February? End of February. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a little bit of time left there. Yep. Um, to hear more on that. So I, I would say any day now. But hear, I, do, they need to have a, do, do they need to have a festival? Like they can't, they haven't gotten products out from two years ago. <laughs> so it's almost kind of like the same boat as like manufacturers not going to PCA who just, they have nothing to sell. Yep. Um, but, you know, there's other angles of that. Um, you know, so Charlie talked about it in one of his articles this week. You know, they have a big charity fundraiser, um, you know, they have a big auction rather. So, you know, those are big parts of what they do in at the Habanos festival. True. Very true. Yeah. It's definitely I mean, not, it's definitely apples and oranges, but I mean, they could put a, they could put something on and announce a product and you may not see it till 2026. So I mean, that's just, I think people have come ex to expect that whatever they see at Habanos, they're not going to see for at least a year. I think people are trained with that right now. Dan Thompson, the embargo ending doesn't resolve Cuban manufacturing. Their communist legal structure makes foreign investment almost impossible. This is also a true statement yep. as well. Dan knows um, more about that than me, so I'm going to take his word on it. Yeah, I mean, so if the embargo ended, that doesn't necessarily mean yeah. that their com government completely yeah. changed. Yeah. I think that it probably, yeah. Yeah. For, it, for it to change, it probably should. Yeah. But that might not be the case if and yeah. when. I think it's more of a when than an if. I think eventually, at some yeah. point, that embargo just has to end yep. uh, one way or the other. Um, whether you support it or not, I'm just saying, like, I think that it will just because I think the right people in the governments will be in the right place and it'll just happen for whatever reason or whatever, it'll just end. Um, this isn't like a should it or whatever. Uh, it's more of just, do I think it will at all? Yes, I think it will. Yeah. I think eventually it's going to end. It's not a question of if it's when. Um, and the hypotheticals that I bring up are more of, well, when it happens, right? what do we foresee happening from that? Yeah. Um, so I, I just want to make that point clear. No, that's a good conversation. That's a, that was a good. And by the way, that was a very good article that they did. Uh, the half row article. Um, give them. There was a lot of good research they did. They did their homework on that article. That yeah, wasn't absolutely. one. They, that wasn't one that they just 
plucked from something. They, they found a source that led them to like write that story. I'd encourage people to check out that article um, by Charlie. It was a very well written article. Um, I'll actually put it in the comments in the chat if people want to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know it was a good article and it's good information. Um, you know, you could even say, I mean, Cuba's a little different, obviously, you know, especially with their government and kind of how everything happens over there. But I mean, you could say just in terms of all countries or manufacturer, um, something like that could, could happen anywhere, really. Um, and stuff like that happening further impacts the cigar industry. And yeah. what does this go back to? Oh, those price increases we were talking about, it's stuff like that that further enhance, regardless of inflation, yep. prices yep. going up. Um, you know, and and I and I foresee it getting a little worse, to be honest with you. I foresee I think it'll, it'll get better eventually, but it's gonna get it's gonna get way uglier as an industry in terms of just like the costs and, yep. and more of the logistics and stuff like that that are happening on the back end. Um I think it's gonna get worse in the next year or two and i think eventually they'll climb out of it but i don't think that they're they're heading towards yeah. the i think they're still heading down yeah um it's just kind of the the tone of the world right now you know what i'm saying yeah. it's yeah no one in particular it's fall it's just kind of the way everything's really unfolding so i think there's going to be a lot more that manufacturers are going to have to battle against so if you thought like 2020 and 2021 were kind of rough for manufacturers uh, even Steve Saka has been very public about this. Yeah. He, he talking about like 2022. He 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 already has said 2022 is going to be way worse than 2021. Yeah. He was very oh, public. He, he, vocal yeah, about oh, he's, that. he's very true. And like I said, if you hadn't heard uh, the light them up recap show, Nick Perdomo was on that this week. He talked a lot about the worker shortage. Pete also talked about it on the Thursday show as well. Uh, there's a shortage of workers in in, in particular in Nicaragua right now. People leaving the country. And uh, so that's a problem they got right now. And, and that's not going to help. Um, I mean, you may say uh, 0% unemployment is not always a good thing. So, no, you no. Know, so that's a problem. So, uh, and there's things going on in that country beyond the cigar industry that are causing that. So, um, you know, so that's the way it is. So, yeah, I can imagine. Look, Cuba's having its own set of problems right now. We saw that this past summer. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I think it's gonna be a rough. I think it's gonna be a rough year for. I think it's gonna be a rough year. I think it's gonna have a rough year next year, Cuba. I really do. Yeah, I think the fertilizer problem seems so small, but it, you know, you look at it and read that article. Like I said, it was a very good article. That's why I want folks to read it. Uh, it opens up a lot of eyes, and then you go, you put the whole picture together. Yeah. It was funny. I can't remember who I was talking to. But this was last year, the end of end of twenty twenty. I should say i forget today's day one uh -huh. so the end of 2020 right um someone was telling me they were talking to someone from habanos and that during the pandemic when shops and lounges across the world were closed um or maybe not closed but you know they were doing some kind of sales but there was no in-person consumption or whatever a lot of the you know we saw the the drive up purchasing from a lot of shops or whatever but um but through the pandemic a lot of those higher end brands from Habanos like Cohiba and the more limited editions of like Monte Cristo and Cohiba and all those, all the really higher end Cubans right. that people often search for, the sales were down dramatically and the lesser known Cuban brands sales were up and people were buying the Garo, the yeah, Juan Lopez. Yep. Which yep. Good, great cigars too, by the way. Yeah. Sancho Panza. Sancho Pan, great, yep. great Cuban cigar. Um, and the, the consensus was, well, there's no in-person consumption at lounges. So people are not spending the money. No, I mean, I, I can tell you that. Brands to, to show off the bands, right? Do no, we, I, yeah, I went to yeah, Cuba. I can tell you that firsthand. That's the yeah. case. Yeah. So there's definitely a band smoking aspect that goes on in a lounge. So, you you hear you know maybe rumors or whatever but um you hear something like that based on cuban cigars outside of the u.s right do we see that in the u.s last year with a lot of the higher end brands we have here or do you think people are still just buying you think the the culture is different here where it doesn't really matter where cigars get consumed people are going to buy whatever they want to buy whether they smoke it at home or they smoke it in front of other people 
I think in the U.S. It's the, there's a small set of lounges that may apply to some of the very high end lounges, but right. for the most part, I think it's not a problem. I, I, there are people just as proud to smoke a Cookie Monster cigar in a lounge and show that they're they're smoking the Cookie Monster cigar uh, as someone who may want to be smoking a Davidoff Royale. Mm-hmm. You know, I just you know, so I think it's a little, and you know, we we've seen it. It's 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 so different here that that the U.S. market is willing to ex- uh, accept craft paper bundle packaging and not have a problem with it. Like I hate it, but guess what? It, people don't. I'm I'm in the minority on that. I, I probably admit that. So I, I don't think it's. I think if you go into a very high end lounge like maybe the Grand Habano Room or something like that, something like that, it's a different story. Um, but that's a small amount. So. You know, so I don't think it's as much of a problem. I think there's enough choice here too, or it doesn't. Someone can really dress up a, a dog rocket too and make it look good. So here, Jay Davis is with us. So shout out to Jay. We love Jay very much. Well, Jay, one of the um, best in the country. Go to Blue Smoke of Dallas, by the way. If you need to get anything from uh, Jay's, got a great selection there. That's like the top of my list for when I eventually make my. Oh, uh, I am too. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I am rescheduling my Texas trip. It's finally gonna happen, but now Ben's not there, so. <laughs> but I, I have to still get back to Texas. Um, sorry, he just kind of had a typo thing. All right, so he originally said, uh, no, in the U.S., okay. with, with curbside, et cetera, people had to know the brand yeah. name, so larger brands did better. Sure. Interesting. That's yeah. a great, and it's a very, and you look at it, it's a very, and I can tell you what, I did the data analysis on Coop of the top brands that people looked for on my website, and this year, it very much skewed towards the big brands, more so than in previous years. So guess what? People were looking for Rocky Patels, Monte Cristos, uh, Davidoffs, you know, Liga Provada. I mean, it just showed this year in the analytics that people were very, very interested in that stuff. And uh, it generated a lot of traffic. You may not see a lot of links on Facebook with that stuff, but the traffic on my website was very much reflective of that. And I think that started last year and, and, Look, it's it's very true. Like, look, let's give a good example of this. Like, Mickey Mickey Peg had All Saints cigars out last year, right? Yeah, great cigar to dedication, right? Well, how many people are going to go into a curbside and ask about the de- dedication? Probably not. Yeah. I'll give Dave Garofalo a little bit of a pass because he was out there. He literally moved the store outside. If you remember, <laughs> yeah, he had I the, know. he had this he had a little kiosk out there. I was there. <laughs> oh, it was. A, and, and look, brilliant move by Dave. Bro, it was fun. I felt bad for him. He's out there like waving guys off the street. But but great job. It was a great job. And, and so I believe and I believe like retailers like Jay would do the same thing. You know, Jay's very good at uh, a brand he carries is a brand he's gonna sell. And and if he's behind the brand, he's certainly gonna recommend. But not all retailers are in that boat, I'll be honest with you. So he also says, P.S. William Cooper, it's called the cookie per P. I know. I can't <laughs> <laughs> I know I saw that. You know, yes, I was Jay. gonna say that was one of the other things about that interview with pete that you did thursday night that i i was really paying attention to um because i know we you kind of talked about some of that copyright stuff um yes with pete because of his monster series uh-huh i did find it interesting how you know he has tried to it is kind of a gray area because like he kind of he uses those with the intention of it being what it really is but he changes the names he chops the names down like the frank the chalk the tiff uh, without actually using the full name of a actually, you know, known. He was, I thought it was a very candid answer he gave on it too. Yeah. No, I was just, I thought it was interesting. And it's, it's an interesting point, you know, for someone to bring that up. Um, and I think he's right with, um, he said the use of like half of the Frank face on the box was probably more touchy because yeah, it's yeah. actually like a depiction versus like a play on the name. Um, so I get that, but I, I just, I really thought that was an, a really great segment of that show when you guys had that conversation. So, um, and there was more I wanted to get to, unfortunately, I, you reminded me of something, which we'll talk about another time, maybe, but I didn't get to it. Unfortunately, uh, it was just, I reminded the, you what, like during yeah, that I show, saw, I saw it afterwards, a couple of things you would ask me about, but I didn't go I down didn't that route. Yeah. A lot of times but, uh, when I watch you and I, I see something and I think of it, I send it in. And then if you get to it, great. If yeah. Not, like, I know we'll eventually get it answered. <laughs> yeah. It's like because I'm the producer and the host. So it's like a little tricky. But uh, no, look, Pete, 
I, I normally don't brag about shows. I like I, all my shows are great. Uh, that I've had Pete on three or four times. By far, that was the best interview we had with Pete uh, this year. Uh, the, um, ben and Bear did a great show with him a few months ago. You had him on. Yep. Uh, but this one, I was exceptionally proud of this show. He gave a lot of insights into some projects he's got going on. Uh, you know, he talked to, back to the monster. You know, I forgot about the whole monster drink thing, by the way. I remember he had said that to me once before. Oh, yeah, but I remembered I, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, a lot of stuff, you know, just uh, he was in rare form, which was good. He was in great, uh, great. We did two and a half hours with him and very gen- And he wasn't feeling great either that night. Well, at least he was feeling better. But uh, so uh, Pete's thank you, Pete, as well. Yeah, he did that with COVID. I thought that was great. You know, he just kind of toughed through it and uh, he did it. But I think he yep. was definitely feeling better. Like Abe, I know, was not. He texted me that day. He's like, I'm in bad shape. And I was well, like, Well, Abe, you're, Abe, you're not. I told him, like, you're not coming on. Like, I, I don't even. Did try you see like, the show we did with Saka? He was not looking good on that show with Saka. You could tell. I missed that. Yeah. But, he, yeah. but I, I, I had heard about it after. Um. So I was like, yeah, I was just like, I said to him right away. I'm like, no, 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 no. Uh, yeah. I'm not gonna like. Don't even try. Like, just, just focus on going home and like going to bed like we'll do this another day <laughs> like I, I don't want to be that guy's like well i mean i was like don't i'll figure it out um i felt bad because he's like yeah man it's just it's not, uh, i mean shape i was like i i don't blame you abe uh he's an exceptionally hard working person uh exceptionally good person and um you know get better uh we need you abe uh absolutely we need you abe in the next for many years to come uh, i love big so- delicious uh, big you know. delicious yeah, and, and we want little delicious to come out soon so a little bit yeah. delicious so uh yeah. yeah uh he's gonna get back in top shape so he can keep on um he can keep on building with uh dgs get that good for 2022 l- l- listen yeah the was yeah it was great uh you know i, I have the advent calendar i'll just tell you mm-hmm. uh w- one of the great pieces of uh packaging i've ever seen uh one of the great gifts that you could get yourself or get someone. Yep. Uh, I'll tell you something. The cigars in that, there were no duds in that list. There were some I liked better than others, but there were no duds in that list. Uh, they had a package. They were great, great cigars. Um, I'm not going to spoil it for folks, but the, the final cigar, number 25, was something special. So Now, I, I tried not to, I specifically tried not to follow along with it until like the end. Because um, yep. I didn't get one because I just... We had so much, um, kind of at full capacity. So I was just like, yeah, just there was some stuff I was like, I, I we just we can't can't we just right. can't get too much. Right. Um, but I didn't get one. But I also I wanted to kind of steer away from it till it was all over, so I could kind of see it all as a whole. Yeah, I'm still um, going through mine actually. I went. To, oh, you I didn't finish few, yours. Yeah, so I started at 16, went to 25, and now I'm back up to like seven or eight right now. Okay. So I'm still going. I'm actually still unveiling some of the cigars. Uh, I just kind of wanted the fun of it of doing a cigar a day. So I haven't, I've been ignoring it as well. Because I was going to say, because I, I don't know if you know, are they all in the same order or are they all random? I don't know. No, remember. they're all in the same order and they go in like price order. They go in MSRP wow. order. So. And number Lord, one was not a dud. Is... And number one was not a dud is what okay. I'll just tell you. So that's how good it was. Yeah, this is good stuff. Number two is a really nice cigar, by the way. Uh, I won't, Were they it, exclusives or was it existing stuff that was just all existing stuff? It wasn't. It was all okay. existing national brands. Uh, there were a couple of new releases that were thrown in this year, too, which I thought was really cool. Uh, and then there was some like classics in there as well. So uh, I think like of the one, maybe there's two cigars in there that I normally don't smoke, but they're not duds. Um, they're just something maybe I give to someone else. You know? Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'm very happy with it. Uh, so it's a uh, I'm gonna have a photo essay thing on it when I'm done. I know. Uh, but Garrett from How About That Cigar, good friend of ours. Uh, I know he did some videos, and I did not, Garrett. I didn't watch your videos. I will, but it's part of again. I didn't want to ruin it yet. So, um, but I know Garrett has some videos out there as well with it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I know that he was making some videos. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I I didn't want to like. I didn't want to read into all that stuff too much because I, I didn't want to really yep. see because I didn't yep. get one, but I was still like, I kind of want to like wait till the end to digest it all yep. and kind of go through it. So now, now that I know you haven't even finished it, that's interesting. I'm curious when you are done with it to see how, like what you thought, 
once you're fully. Yeah, I'm going to do a, I mean, there's only one, one gripe I have at the whole thing and I'll mention it right now. Okay. It's not a gripe. Uh, I would have just done it where you could easily replace the humidification. You kind of have to tear the box to do it. And I don't think it's, I think if you could just make that where you could drop a new humidification thing in, I think it's just a cool thing you can use it around. Uh, and maybe make some of the True. doors a little more sturdier, but, but again, I'm not, that's nitpicking. This is this, the plus is far outweigh the minuses with this. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm going to keep the, I think we're going to keep the box anyway. We were talking about, it looks, it looked great under the Christmas tree. It's sitting under the Christmas tree right now. So it, looks, it looks, the lights kind of shine on it. It's really nice. My oh, wife really? is totally fine with it. Yeah. Yeah. So she yeah, added to your decorations. It. Yeah. It's like behind the Christmas village under the tree. So <laughs> it's a big smoking tower. Yeah. Jay actually just brought up a, uh, an interesting point. Epic PhD discussion last week of trademarks versus trade dress. Yeah, that was the other point. Whole, that was Pete, man. That's educated. That's Pete low knowledge on people. And I thought it was very interesting because why it can be, while it can be related to the cigar industry, um, and we can be related to cigars, it, that's knowledge that you can use, you know, kind of in any industry if you're ever in that yeah. playground of having to go through that process. Um, interesting to learn just kind of the differences, yeah. yeah, kind of stuff that people try to stay away from with it, what they use it for, what they yeah. you just, just so many different angles yeah. with it. I thought it was very informational and I, I, I learned a lot of good things from it too. Yeah. Um, so I, and I didn't realize, so like trade dresses, if I remember correctly, a trade dress would be something like of a color or something like that, that a company wants to put like a trademark on, but it's classified as a or trade design. Dress. Yeah. Color like pattern, a pattern. Like a design. Yes. Yeah. Like I know. So Nicole's dad is a printer, right? Right. And so he's talked to me about it and showed me kind of his stuff and what he does. Um, and we were talking about all the ink that he uses and I remember him bringing up like, Oh, well, Coca-Cola is red is like whatever this color is. And they own the rights to that color. But after listening to like the conversation you had with Pete, when Pete was on there, I kind of like understand a little bit more of like how that works, just like how certain companies will come up with certain elements of their own that they want to protect. I have, I talked a little about this on the show. Uh, my dad, who uh, used to own a limousine company, he had a uh, and he had a contract with CBS Records. He got to meet a lot of executives and artists. Um, one of them was Weird Al Yankovic, who I happened to meet. And I remembered I was about seventeen years old, and this whole discussion on the parody stuff came up with the song. Oh, I remember this conversation. Yes. Yeah. And Weird Al talked a lot about two things, and I didn't mention the second thing, and I should have about like he always asked for permission, but he mm -hmm. also was very careful about his album covers and his record covers to not step on that. Piece. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if he's covering like Michael Jackson's Beat It, he didn't make it look like the Beat It or the Thriller album. It was something very different and unique. And it was a lot of that reason I think goes back to I didn't kind of put the two together until after I re-listened to the show when Pete talked about trade dress. And I said, yeah, I remember that part of the conversation as well. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Um, especially in his case, you know, with all those covers that he does. And I remember yeah, but, he, saying, but Al said he did look, he says, I didn't want to be the guy to have to fight this for the rest of my career because I want to just be able to do this. And a lot of looking, a lot of artists want Prince turned him down. You know, Prince, I remember he said Prince turned me down. I was, he goes, I'm fine with it. That's actually not much of a shocker for those who don't know Prince. Um, he was, very, he was very protective of his catalog. And I remember yeah, watching it, an interview that he gave where he said that, you know, he owned all of his own music. The only thing he doesn't own is purple rain because purple rain, was technically the soundtrack, yep. the movie that the studio owned. And yep. that was like the only thing he didn't own. So, um, but even though he, he wrote all the songs for it yep. and he performed all the songs, it technically wasn't his. And it was the only thing that I think he said he did not own. And, you know, it's funny because you didn't hear a lot of Prince music. Either. He never really let people use the rights to it. No, um, he, was, he was very, very protective of that. But um, you would see Purple Rain stuff once in a while because that wasn't his decision. Yeah, and you know, we, we you know we do music on jukebox, right? And there's a lot of parallels with the cigar industry and music industries, is what you'll find. Uh there's production and then there's distribution. And they're two different animals. And guess what? The distribution piece is tougher than the production piece, just like in the cigar industry. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it was a big thing when Prince took over his own distribution. That was a big deal when that happened with Paisley Park. You know, he took control of his own distribution. It was landmark when he did that back in the 80s and i remember uh i was reading so do you know uh one of my favorite movies almost famous you know that what, movie, a, right? what a great movie love that movie yeah love yeah. that movie 
Um, you know the story behind that movie. Cameron Crowe, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for those who don't know, Cameron Crowe, who, who did that movie, it, it's kind of loosely based on himself. Yep. Um, when he was younger, traveling around with like Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin, yep. um, trying to write a story for Rolling Stone magazine. And I remember reading an article about when they, they wanted to use Zeppelin songs in the movie. And so they had to show the movie to Robert Plant and um, Jimmy Page. And they had, if I remember this correctly, they, they show them the movie and they get to the golden God scene in the movie. And Robert Plant laughed because if you didn't know, he was the one who originally said that. Um, and afterwards they were like, yeah. oh, we like the movie or whatever. And they were like, so we'll let you use all the songs except one because we don't let anyone use it. Do you know what song that is? If you had to guess, but the one song that Zeppelin doesn't let anyone use. Still would have, not still would have, um, yeah. still would have, heaven? okay. Yeah. It's still would okay. And they were like, but it's okay. We're going to give you another song for free. Right. As like a, like a, like a, to make it right. But like, we don't let anyone use um, still would heaven. So I, because on the music topic while we're here, I always thought that was interesting. And like how, and it's true. You look at that, like certain bands with like iconic songs or whatever there, they don't usually lend those out. There, there are some out there that you just, you never see because those bands are protective of not overly using it and marketing for other stuff. It's like, no, this is our thing and we don't want it to be over marketed. Um, so you just, know, you know, I just thought that was always interesting. Yeah. I'll let a side note, you know, one of my favorite music events of the year is the Kennedy Center Honors, right? Mm-hmm. And look, but let's not get political about the, about the politics involved. It's something that the president does do. But, you know, they honor artists. And then there's tributes that are done by other artists for the artists getting honored, which has got to be a very tough thing. And the big, you know, if you remember, when, I don't know if you remember when Led Zeppelin got honored, Heart covered Stairway to Heaven. And I actually was wondering what their reaction was going to be to Led Zeppelin. And they were brought to tears. I mean, you can see them. And, you know, again, how, just now knowing how protective they are of that song, just from hearing this, it's a big, it's a big deal. You know, that's so... I love doing. I love seeing those reactions. Uh, and luckily, most of the reactions are very positive. That yeah, I haven't even saw anyone like smirk at it. You know, I saw mm. Barry Gibb once. Uh, I think they there was a Glee tribute to Barry Gibb, and it was an embarrassment, unfortunately, uh, to him. But it wasn't at the Kennedy Center. Honest, I can see Barry Gibb's like, just get me out of here. You know, it's like, <laughs> so yeah, no, and it's funny because you know, a lot of musicians and artists like that. You know they treat their they treat their songs very similar to the way these manufacturers treat their cigars. Yeah. You know, with all their different lines that they have, it's yeah. almost like each cigar that they make in each blend and each size specifically. It's like each one of those is like a song to like an artist, right? It's it's their creation. It's something they worked on. They they spent time to produce and they put it out there. Um, so when we have those conversations of like when you're doing reviews or you're talking about certain things and you don't want to go too harsh on something if you don't like it because you know that that someone's someone's baby that someone's creation um but also like when you in terms of protecting it too right so you see people get upset when people try to rip things off from each other or or they do something that's kind of an imitation of something else or whatever and you know these these other manufacturers get like wow well this was kind of like my special creation i'm kind of known for it it was kind of a big deal and then someone else came along and kind of stole the idea or ripped the ripped the idea away um it's true. It's kind of all the same. You know, you, you look at these cigars as being the offspring in a way of these cigar makers. Yeah. Um, and it's I'll why they you. protect them so hard. I mean, they do. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a good story, Matt. And I'm not going to name names here because I, it's in confidence, but I'll tell the uh, context of it. There was a major cigar that was released at the trade show this year. Right. And it got a lot of buzz. And I was talking to another manufacturer and he was telling me, yeah, that's coming out of the factory of a cigar that I had that was basically using that same wrapper that I discontinued. Huh. And now and now this other company's kind of getting all the press on it. And I thought it was very and when, and he, and, and, and the, he was very specific. And when I went back and looked at this stuff, he's 100 percent on because uh, you go back five years or six years ago when that cigar was released for, with that wrapper for the first time, it just didn't get the play that this other company did right now so it's kind of like yeah you know there was some sen- but sensitivity but however the scar was discontinued so it's important to know and it was the same factory producing this by the way so right. 
It was interesting. Yeah, to hear that. Um, that was pretty much all the things that I wanted to cover yeah. on my list. All right. Was I there anything? You, yeah. There any, I want, yeah. All right. I want to go through something. Can we do throw it through quickly, right? Um, so I'm not going to go through all these stories in detail, but these are my top 12 cigar stories of the year. Okay. Right? And yeah, what I want you it. to do, and what I want you to do is tell me if you think it belonged on there. And then at the end, tell me if I missed something. You want to go through them all first or one by one? I'll go through them one by one. I'll just list it. I'll just name it. And you tell me, yeah, valid to be in the top 12 or not valid. Okay. All right. Yeah. And I, uh, okay. And I'm, I'm, this is, you could be totally open. All right. So the first story was the, uh, launch of Ferry Otego. Uh, that's where that was big news. You know what's surprising? It was probably uh, normally I don't go for a small company like that in there, but these are iconic brands, and it was a big deal. Yeah, that was that was a special circumstance on a no, yeah quote unquote new brand yeah, launch. Yeah, yeah, there was more going on there. Yeah. Is what I'll say. Yeah. So I, I I think that's valid. Okay, this was probably the one I got the most feedback on. Is the second one, Oliva Cigar Company in 2021. I thought it was a big year for Oliva. And I think it's setting the tone for the future. They had several releases at the trade show. They've acquired the Puros Indios brands. Mm -hmm. uh, the owner of Oliva, the Vendamelo family, uh, they are now investing in a, a, an online retailer called Brand Shopper, which has something called Cigar Page. You may not like it. It's ruffling and feathers. But I thought Oliva made a lot of moves this year that's telling me I think we're going to see a very different Oliva in the next few years. And they also bought Famous, didn't they? They didn't buy Famous, no. There were rumors about it, but they didn't buy it. Oh, that's what I remember now. Yes. Yep. I remember. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Yep. 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 All right. Um, Scandinavian tobacco group splitting general into general and Fords. Yeah, because that that that's worthy because that ruffled a lot of feathers in the process, too. Yeah. And I don't know if it's going to work yet or not. Um, I pointed out they did this once before, like they had a brand called Foundry and they originally tried to use Foundry. They tried to use brokers separate from their sales force to selling it. But this is they set up a whole new in-house sales force to do this. Uh, and they basically split the brands right now. And I, I thought it was like, I don't, I don't remember anything equivalent like that happening before. You there? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. I, okay, was, I was reading something on the, okay. on the, the my, uh, okay. my feed on my phone yeah. froze and it was all Jim, it was all jangled and I had to whatever. And I kind of okay. got all, it all came in at the same time. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> all right. All right. So the next two are pretty, I think we talked about this already. Uh, supply and demand. We talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a given. Uh, broadly shortage. We talked about that. That's the fifth thing. Uh, the de-virtualization of the cigar industry this year. Uh, people getting back on the road, more in-person stuff. Um, not as many of these virtual shows anymore. Basically, McAuliffe, Drew State, and Fuente kept theirs, but everyone else pretty much went away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, that was – I think you're right on that, but I think there was still a lot of virtual stuff going on. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah I, and I agree there was. Because like, I, you know, I think people, manufacturers and retailers, I think they both learned that like even, even after, like when people were back on the road, I think they learned that it's something that they could still use. It's, it's a good, it's a good tool. They can make more money with it. They can reach more people. They can do some different things with it. So, yeah, I don't think it was where it was in 2020, and I don't think in any other circumstance it ever would be because there's just no need for the amount, yeah. the amount that we had. I mean, no one was on the road. Everyone was home. No one was out and about. So everything had to be online. Yep. So I think 2021 the way things kind of came about after everyone started getting out again, like, yeah, it wasn't what it was, but I don't think it was what it was before. Agree. Which I think, which I think is good. Yep. Agree. I agree with you on that part too. Now, most of the major festivals were canceled this year. Exceptions being Rocky mountain cigar festival, cigar fishing on big smoke and the Tampa heritage festival. But, but you had like cigar fest canceled Drew state yep. canceled D 25 and the barn smokers. You had the Habanos Festival, Pro Cigar and Puro Sabor canceled. Yep. Great, Great Smoke went virtual, uh, and La Zona Palooza was, was canceled as well. So mm -hmm. I think there was still a lot of that being canceled. I agree. Yep. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. But on a separate note, Great Smoke's event, I think, was, was huge. I think oh, it, it was. was worth, yeah, that was a separate story I had. 
And I think that, well, oh, so that's a separate story. Yeah, I mean, I think that one was very significant in the way, first of all, the way it went down, what they put into that and what they got out of it in terms yeah. of just the production, the quality, the outreach, the amount of people they were able to engage with it. Definitely probably bigger than the Great Smoke in-person events from years past because, I mean, now people have to travel. So now you're getting all the people who wouldn't have even traveled before to be able to buy into that yep. to participate. So I think that was huge. I think Abe is smart to keep it to, even though he can have people in person again, well, let's keep that virtual thing going. Let's yeah. not throw that away. That's definitely a huge thing. Yep. Yeah, it's going to oh, change yeah. a lot of logistics of the event this year, is according to, and I'm sure Abe will get into that on, on your show next Tuesday. So, uh, uh, if I wasn't clear, though, on the one before about the stuff being virtual and all that, uh -huh. I would say that would be the one for me. I'd be like, eh, I don't know. I don't know okay, if that's much of an impact. Okay, that's, that's a fair. I'll give you a fair one. Yeah. And then we'll kind of look, we'll see what we could have put in place of that. Yeah. Okay. The 12 stories. Yeah. Um, the return of the PCA trade show. Um, that's a given. I mean, we don't yeah, have to Everyone that. was talking about that nonstop. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. So, I don't think we need to rehash that. Um, the next one was the cigar industry holding off the big tax hike. It was a big win. That's a big win. Yeah. It was a big win. That uh, has to be there. It has to be there. I mean, those are, that was the biggest challenge they faced this year. Guess what? Mm -hmm. It's off the table, at least for now. Yep. Yeah. Um, this one was a was a little more of a low key one, but there were big changes with all the trade organizations this year at CRA, PCA, and the CAA especially. Mm -hmm. Like CAA has a new chairman and a new president. Like so, they they've completely changed that whole organization. But you know, PCA brought Glenn Loop and uh, from CRA. Yep. Yeah. He went into a full time role this year. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan Parada also went in there. Uh, I know you just had on Josh and Glenn. Yep. Uh, and then CRA, you know, there's a new chairman in Gary Pesh, a new president in Karen Smith. So there's, there's, they don't have an executive director yet. I think it's a big thing, but there was a lot in there. And then there's a there's a category which I put in every year. It's, it's people who change jobs in the cigar industry. Um, and okay. there's a whole list of people. Um, I'm curious. I don't know. Is there any like big job change that you saw someone make this year that stands out? Like the big, like, what do you think the biggest, but aside from the CAA ones and all that? Like me, like just on, like in the manufacturer's realm. Yeah. Of like people going, um, well, I mean, there was, it was kind of technically kind of last year, but it's still relevant. Um, Jose going over to Arturo Fuente. That was last year. Yep. Yep. I, think that's I know it was, one. I know it was last year, but I, I'll, but this year was in. his first, but is his first year doing this. Right. Right. Yep, I think so that yeah, was that one was a big one. Yeah. Um, uh, who was it from Ashton that left and went over to um El Septimo? I have that on the list. Chip Goldine. Yes. Yes. That was a big. That was a big one. Yeah. And that happened like right before that, the trade show too, didn't yep, it? Yep. Yeah. Yep. That was another one that I was like, yeah. oh, really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's two departures that I think were big though, and we're uh there were the Hanky Kellner and Eladio Diaz departures. Hmm. I forgot about which, those. Yes. Which really happened last year, I was told. But we're like finalized this year. Uh, those are big changes at Davidoff. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so basically they're all out, they're all out at Davidoff now. Yeah, um, and there's like a there's a new number two guy at Davidoff too. Uh, because Jim Young left and there's a guy named Luke Hyperant who took over. So this Davidoff had a lot of changes this year, but it was more on the on the international end, not so much on the U.S. end, right? But you know, I, well, but yeah. Before I before we continue, really quick. So, what what are your thoughts on that, and how does that affect uh, Davidoff moving forward? Um, I think it's a little wait and see. Um, they have a guy named Hamlet who's running the factory right now. Uh, I haven't met him, but I know people have met him, and they're very high on him. So uh, we'll see what happens. So I think they may be in good hands with the factory. Okay. Um, and in the Europeans, it's hard to tell what's happening on the European end of things. Uh, there's definitely been some more tension to cost cutting. I can see at least with Davidoff, yep. that may be a good thing because maybe they would, you know, they got to be profitable. So, um, you know, I think Davidoff is well positioned in the U S right now. They took on Ferry Otego. Mm -hmm. So I think they'll be fine. I think they'll be fine. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're definitely a brand that speaks for yeah. themselves. I yeah. mean, um, Every, I mean, no matter how big or small you are, you still yeah. gotta work hard to, to do business. 
and, yep. you know, and all that, but I, but yep. you know, Davidoff being where they are, um, I don't think it has the same ramifications of a smaller company. Yep. So like you said, it's definitely a wait and see. I don't think anything yep. dramatic can happen too quickly. So, okay. So then my question is, uh, we say, let's take that one story off the table on the devirtualization. What story, if we have to put one more story in there that maybe should have been on there, what should be on there? You know, the first one that comes to mind was the, um, was the change in the head of the FDA. Yeah. Um, I kind of counted that in the personnel one. Uh, but he hasn't technically stepped okay. down yet, but yes. Right. Uh, that's going to be a big, that's going to be big next year, I believe. Yeah. Cause I mean, especially after talking to Glenn and Josh on the show, I mean, that, that definitely is. Glenn gonna, was funny on that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's definitely gonna, that's definitely gonna change a lot of things. Um, I would have loved to have seen any meetings those two guys had. <laughs> oh, been a fly can, on the wall. I can only imagine. Yeah. I can only imagine. It's, that's going to be uh, a huge, this look, that's a huge appointment coming up next year. Uh, that we really got to watch. Uh, and what, what um, I guess that's going to come down from Biden's uh, health and human services. And, and Does the new... Biden pick that himself? Actually, I don't think so. No, it's not Biden. I think it's going to come from the head of the FDA. Because Mr. Zeller ran the tobacco piece of it. And the head of the FDA is, uh, is going to be probably Robert Cardiff again. So uh, Robert Cardiff, Califf. I'm sorry, Robert Califf. So yes. I think it's going to be his call to make. Do they bring someone in that is, what's their view? Are they going to be very hardline like Mitch Zeller was on, on premium tobacco? It's going to be very interesting on that. Yeah, it's definitely one to watch. It's I was definitely... surprised that wasn't one of Charlie. Charlie did his 10 questions article. I thought for sure that was going to be one on that. Because that's my biggest question of going into 2022 is who gets that job? Uh, yeah, I would agree with you on that. I think that's definitely a big one because that's going to. Yeah depending on who it is and what their thoughts and feelings are right. and just like how they are to work with. Yeah. Um, that could affect a lot of things for yeah. the industry in, yeah. in the, um, in the government sector side, side of things. Yeah. Do you remember when this is probably before you kind of came on into the media scene? Do you remember when Scott Godley was named the uh, commissioner of the FDA? No. People, the industry was like embracing this guy. <laughs> he couldn't have been happier, right? And he was a very, I think he was a very good FDA commissioner. Um, and normally an FDA commissioner doesn't last in that job very long, right? Right. It's just, uh, and now they're bringing back the old one uh, who was before Gottlieb. So I don't see the cigar industry going, wow, here's a, you know, we're happy to have this guy back. When it was Scott Gottlieb, because Scott Gottlieb had wrote some stuff that kind of indicated he was sympathetic to the premium cigar industry. And what we really learned is he, he is provided the science backed it up. That was always Scott Gottlieb's position on that. So, but yeah, this is gonna be very interesting, this Mitch Zeller one. Uh, and the interesting thing is I heard Scott Gottlieb and Mitch Zeller got along pretty well. So, and Mitch- Yeah, Mitch I, I, really think I, 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 I think I heard Glenn bring that up actually. Yeah. Before. So. Yeah, for me, that that's that's probably one of my biggest questions, aside from anything like outside of the governmental part of it. Um, I think everything considered, that's one of my top questions because I want to know. All right, so where uh, where do we go from here? What happens? Who who steps in? Then what happens? Yeah. And yeah, you know, Mitch Zeller was definitely not not anywhere on our side. No. Um, did not like to play with us at all in the sandbox. Didn't really, yeah was very unreasonable so, yeah so the question is well who takes that role now um you know the feeling i get from from glenn was like well anyone could be better and it's like well you say that but you know until that person is appointed and we see how they function we won't really know that answer yeah we, it's it's exactly that's exactly how I, I take a wait and see with that one before we get i mean it's i guess it's not a bad thing that he's moving on but you gotta be careful what you you know it's like when you fire the coach right you better have another coach in the wings who can do a better job. Uh, right. Look at the New York, New York Giants are a prime example of that. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm just saying it was uh, <laughs> prime three in a row. So, uh, although I, don't, I still think they should have kept Shermer a couple of years ago. I think uh, he needed another year, but that's my opinion. But, but no, it's, it's kind of along those analogies. You know, you got to make sure you have someone in there. That Side, uh, Sidebar really quickly since we're uh -huh. on the topic. Really quick. Uh-huh. Does Urban Meyer ever coach in the NFL again? No. 
No. He will coach in college again. And I predict it will be at a, uh, a, a large mid-major that will give, like, uh, you know, maybe he goes to a school like a Louisville or, uh, you know, something along those lines. Um, UCF, you know, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of going, I think he will coach again, but he will never coach in the NFL again. Because the Jacksonville owner, from what I understand, is a pretty good owner to work for. Yeah. Uh, and he, you know, I think, and I, you know, I, while I was very pissed off, he fired Coughlin. And I don't think he should have. There was some, I think he was under pressure in the organization to do that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I, you know, when you can't get along with a good owner, um, it's just, yeah. Then, then I, you know, people are questioning that hire to begin with was a bad move. Um, so. I don't think he coaches again yet, but I think he coaches again. Okay. Okay. Fair. Look, Rick, Rick Pitino's coaching again in basketball at Iona. So it, ha- it, it you can, you can, you can, you can come back. Do you think you ever see uh, Jim Harbaugh coming back up to the NFL? Coach I do. I do. And I, I think he did a great job. I think he's better pro coach to be honest with you. I thought, you know, he did a great job with the Niners. Uh, I, I would love to see that guy back in the NFL. Yeah. Uh, I always, I always thought, Giant make a great Giants coach. I'll tell you that. Uh-huh. Yeah. I always thought, you know, he should have, uh, I don't know, stuck he, it out a little longer. He, I mean, the, the issue was his alma mater called on him. I know. That's I know. When it gets, that's when it gets tough with the, uh, you know, that's when it gets tough with that. Um, so when the alma mater calls and you're very deep and you have deep roots with the uh, boosters and all that, you know, it's hard to turn out. And it was a big deal. It, he got a very, look, he has a lot more power in college football. It's true. But, but I think he, he got so close to winning. And he lost to his brother in the Super Bowl. I know. Uh, which people don't realize what, what an incredible Super Bowl that was to have two brothers coaching each other and the whole blackout and everything. It, it was, it was a, and it was great to see the Niners back in the Super Bowl. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, I could, I see, I see Harbaugh coming back at some point um, to a very unique situation where I think a team that he can win with fast. I don't see him going into a rebuilding effort like Urban Meyer. Right. Um, I feel the same. But I didn't, I didn't want to dwell on it too much because we were in the middle of something else. I just no, wanted to pick no, it. Was really good, it, was good. Was a good, it was a good conversation. I'll give you one question I have, and it goes back to the Oliva. I'm really curious to see what Oliva does in 2022, particularly with these acquiring those Purus Indios brands. Uh, we interviewed Corey. Corey said there's things in the works. He couldn't talk about it yet, and I kind of understand that. They probably haven't figured all that out. But that's a real interesting question I have, is what are they going to do with those brands? And I, like I said, I think Oliva's making moves right now. They, they went through a big factory upgrade a couple of years ago. They have one of the strongest sales forces in the country. Uh, Corey is a phenomenal CEO, phenomenal individual. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, I, I see, I see that as um, I'm, I'm, you know, leave is a big brand. So I'm excited to see what, what's going to happen. And I think the European ownership has been really good for them. They've left the lever alone and they know that they had a really good, they bought a good thing. And they rely on their core competencies, much like when Swisher bought through estate. So I think I'm really excited to see what's going to happen with Oliva next year because they're you know a great who, brand. You know who I thought, going kind of on like the smaller scale, you know who I thought did a great job all around this year? United. United did a fantastic job this year. Yeah. Um, you may see another United cigar on my list, just so you know. So, um, so you know, you could, you could look at my list, maybe figure but. But what a year they, they did have a great year. Um, yeah, they they revamped the um they revamped the Garofalo line. Well, they added to the Garofalo line, right? It's they didn't get rid of the others, right? It's, right, no, they added to it, but then they, you know they they changed all of the I can't wait to smoke those cigars, yeah. They they went through and they redid the Bandolero lines. And I think yes. they added to that. Um yep. the, and that's a great line too, very underrated line. The re the redoing of the uh the abuelo. I thought was great. <sighs> Great cigar, both uh, was in your top twenty-five in my my list as well. Yep, mm-hmm. I think they did um, a great job with that cigar. So I think those were good. Um, their firecrackers were good this year. The Perdomo firecracker came back this year. It was great. Um, the uh, I did not smoke. I have it. I haven't smoked it yet, but I do have the foundation one. The I smoked yellow. it. It was good. I'm trying to figure out what they're gonna do this year. 
for for firecracker i've been really f- trying to scratch my head on that one or oh, trying to figure who it is i i really i thought it was gonna be jerry but they just did the chocolate bar cigar so i'm thinking no chocolate bar was also another thing that was good too um that they did yeah. and it i think like rocky gonna i'm gonna be be, a... i'm gonna guess Ro- i'm guessing rocky you i'm gonna go rocky, rocky does Patel. a firecracker i think rocky does a firecracker that's and my what, guess and what line do you think he bases it off of um, it will probably because usually that's the, kind of the theme of how they do it. Yeah, I'm gonna say he maybe goes with the. Uh, I don't think it will be the 60, but maybe like the ALR. Uh, the ALR he could do that with. Um, maybe the what, 15th anniversary. What about the San Andreas? Maybe the San Andreas. That would be a good one too because it's a stronger blend. That's that was the first one that I thought of when you said Rocky. Vintage, like, well, you know, I would you know, probably go yeah. with San Andreas on that one. You look at and the presentation on that with a dark wrapper with the orange band. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I, my guess, I'm going to bet Rocky on this one. So, and I have no inside information on this. What makes you think Rocky though? Yeah, I don't have any information either, but just curious. What makes you say Rocky? I, I think it goes to where they have relationships with, with, they, they go to people they have strong relationships with. They do have a strong relationship with Rocky Patel. Um, so uh, I'll, you know, it's, it's someone that they know well and feel comfortable with, I think, uh, delivering that. Who's got some name notoriety. Uh, like nothing to pick on uh, Omar from Fratello. That one I thought was a little bit of a mistake. I thought it was too small a brand to do it with. Okay. Um, but nothing against, nothing against that. You know, they did it with Roma Craft has a lot of buzz. I get that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christoph, there's a deep relationship they had with them. Saka has the same thing. He has such a following. Saka, but I don't think they're doing any more of those. I don't think so. Uh, no, I thought that was a good. I thought that was a good one. Um, obviously Nick Perdomo, who uh, I think is the best firecracker that's come out. Um, in my opinion, the of, HVC of the, Black Friday was good. The HVC was a, a good one. I uh, I bet they'll keep that for more of a like a secondary release, like they did, you know, a second release. Yeah. Um, which is really good. Um. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to think of this. I thought I, I here's a here's a weird one. They do a little poppy, like a big poppy, a little poppy. I thought that oh, one. Oh, with uh, El Artista. Yeah, 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 yeah. El Artista. Yeah, yeah it's like yeah. It's, I can see they have a good relate. It seems like they have a good relationship with that company. Um, I don't think they go like All Saints though. Um, they have a good relationship with Rafael Nodal, but I don't think they go that route. With Rafael no, I don't. Nadal. I don't think so either. Yeah. Um. So, uh, yeah, you think, I think, um, what, what was your, oh shit. Go ahead. Just, no, I was just going to say it and I forgot which one, uh, man, I just lost it. I was thinking of one that already came out and I was going to ask you your thoughts on it. Oh man. How did I just lose that shit? Oh, there's one they did. Oh, the Kristoff one they did with the, with the pissed off Kristoff. Mm-hmm. Those were super strong. They aged nice, and they aged really well. Yeah, they did. Those were yeah. really good. I remember when I got those. That was one of the strongest ones they did, I think. I got but, those, yeah. like, the day they came out, and then a few days later, I flew to Vegas for 2019 IPCPR, and I was with uh, one of the reps, and we were smoking them, and I just remember being like, I started my smoking at that point. It was at nighttime at Circle Bar, and I remember we were sitting there. I smoked one. And it was John Fozzi from Kristoff. That's he used rap. to be my he used to be my area rep. And then he moved back to Vegas, um, and now it's Heather, um, who's awesome too. I've heard good things about her. Yep. And um, yeah, and so and we were sitting there and we smoked one, and I was like, "Wow, these are strong." I remember smoking the second one, and I just remember being like, "Wow, I'm really starting to feel it now." It was definitely the strongest of the ones I've had. Yeah, oh, yeah that no one doubt about that power to it. And that was like, yeah, those were my first two cigars of the day um it was just like wow those were intense i thought they were good though i've always liked the pissed off line strong but yeah. when i'm in the mood it's a good cigar yeah the um I, I agree uh i know oliver when we had him on the show said they're gonna revamp the irish car bomb at some point you uh, know what? have a new name hey, that was a good cigar one that i don't i don't know if they would do it with but it would make an interesting firecracker is the um the hoya antonio the dark corojo yeah. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because remember, Firecrack is also supposed to be on the on the much stronger side yeah. uh-huh. as part of their concept. So when I think stronger cigars, you know, that that's definitely one that they could do it with. I don't know if they would. Yeah. But like if, if it was made into a Firecracker, I think that one would be an interesting one. How about they do this? 
and this again, I think it's realistic. Asylum. Yeah, they could do it with them. Asylum. Uh, do a little asylum. You know, let's see if you can. You know, go to the, that's a very versatile blend that Asylum Thirteen. Asylum's it, definitely a brand you can do stuff like that with too. Yeah, because they do all sorts of cool stuff. They do, it's, um, you know, and exactly, it's it fits what Asylum does. Yeah, I could definitely see them doing an Asylum Firecracker release. Yeah. Um, um, I thought maybe at one time they would do a debonair because uh, Phil, I don't know if they will. So I'm not going to guess that one, but I can see mm, they do. I don't they think go, they do either. I yeah. don't think they do either, uh, but they go back a long way with Phil. So I'm trying to think who else too, uh, just based on what I know. That they've, they done LFD, they've done LFD. They've done They LFD. did. It was based off the El Jaco, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, it was a great one. Um, I still have a couple of those. I can eat my humidor. But the, um, the the fuse broke off. Yeah. But uh, oh, really? Yeah. Um. Do you think that they? Here's an interesting one. Do you think that they would ever do it off of anything in the selected tobacco portfolio? I. I don't because of the price point. Even if it was like in Bandolero. I don't think Bandolero. Maybe in a few years, I think they got to build that brand up a lot more. Yeah. Um, and plus those are milder cigars though. True. So that, that would be my only thing on that. They'd have to do it in like a Byron. It'd probably have to be the Byron. Like a I, poema, could, but then you're right. It would be a lot. Yeah. And I don't know what like they're said, going for. Yeah. Like I said, they normally like to, that was a whole issue. Why they're not doing Steve cigars. I think the price point is the issue with a lot of that. I think they try to keep that at a reasonable price. You know what is kind of possible? It's a little bit of a stretch. But I could see it happening because things have been done. Some kind of like Liga Unico firecracker. Yeah. Um, could see it. I could see it. Because, I mean, they've done like Pancetta's a store exclusive. UF4's a store exclusive. They've done um, a two guys exclusive in the acid line. I know that the dose. The dose they the did. Sombre. The, the, yeah. uh, oh, the, uh, the Amigos. The Dos Amigos, yes. The Dos Amigos, yes. So there, so there is, but yeah, so they, they've done exclusives with two guys. So there's a, a present. That would be a good one uh, to do an Unico series in, actually. Yeah, I could see that happening. Yeah. And I think it would fit in there, too. Yeah. I could definitely. And I think see. that they could blend, they could blend a Liga that was in the strength profile for that. Yeah. I think the that other, would be possible. Yeah, I think so, too. I mean, I think they can definitely do that. That I don't see any problem with. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of those Liga Nine is. I think Liga Nine would be the probably the optimum. You base it off that blend, and yeah. You kind of work, work, and iterate through it that way. Um, it's. I think they're gonna announce. It. Did Oliver say they're announcing it next month or this month? Now I guess he said something. I don't remember. Show. I thought he I thought, did. I thought Oliver says there's an announcement coming on that. Pretty. Well, soon. I know they're making an announcement on. Uh, he kind of teased something about a distribution thing, I think. Yeah, I remember that. Um, I don't know if maybe it was that. Yeah, because he, he did say, say they were announcing something soon, but I, I don't know if it was a firecracker. It might have been yeah. that other thing. Did they do a McAuliffe maybe? Um, I I don't know. Maybe in a couple of years that would be a brand. <laughs> that, they're building a brand up. You know, they're building a relationship with those guys. Um, I don't know if they do a McAuliffe right away. I that's definitely one that. No, not. I think it's one down the road if they do it. Yeah, I think I think you got to do a little more to build. Like I said, I think they went a little fast with Fratello. That was the only one that was surprising to me. Yeah, it, another it, one, it, uh, Chad Manson. I want a Rojas firecracker mini tacos. I know that they just took in Rojas. I am so, not a fan of that mini t- and tacos. I know everyone loves it. I wasn't blown away by it. I actually did not have that one. It, it's not a bad cigar, but I think I think they have to do a lot of work. Like that that brand needs to really get its distribution in order. I think before they take on a project like that. Here's another brand. Do you think that they do something with JC Newman? That's a good one. That's a really good one. And then which one do you do it with? Um, Jay Davis said Brickhouse. I would say Brickhouse would be the one. Because <laughs> I don't know if I'd see any of them. I don't know if I would see anything out of the Diamond Crown line. No, I don't think they would do a Diamond Crown. Um, plus, that would be a, they'd have to go to Fuente with that, and that's going to be tougher. Um I mean, they're bringing back or they're relaunching El Baton, but I think that's going to, I don't think it would be that. I think it'd it have would, to be Brickhouse. It'd have to be, Br- Brickhouse would be the one. That, I don't think it would be Pro Del Mar. No, I, I think it would be Brickhouse. 
I think Brickhouse would make the most sense. That's a that's a that's a legitimate possibility. That's a legitimate possibility I could see happening. A realistic one. Mark Van Sledright says Nika Rustica Firecracker. That'd be a good one. Mm. And you know what? That'd be you the smoke production up in Nika Rustica. I like that one. I uh I, I think so too. That that would be an interesting one. Yeah. Chad Manson says I would buy McCallum Firecrackers for sure. The ambassador group would wipe them out. They, that's, that's true what, too. That's true. They would they, sell those really well. They would sell. Look, they do a good job. Uh, and look, these are nationally available now. People don't realize that that two guys get them first, and then they allocate a second allocation to uh, qualified United cigar retailers. So, uh, like, you could search around and you could find firecrackers out there. You gotta just do a little googling. I found that's how I found the uh, I found the yellow Wednesdays. So. I don't know uh, why, but my brain is still like I'm trying to think like who else they would make one with. I, I was thinking CLE, but it would be Asylum. Yeah, it would be Asylum. Yeah, be, I could but, still see them doing a JRE. Even if it didn't happen this year, I could see them doing that one. I could see it down the road doing it. Yeah, because yeah. uh, there's definitely it, some stuff. I don't think it will do be the, that. I don't think it will be this year, though. No. Uh, you, do it with the, you do it with Aladino Maduro is what I'd say. Yeah, is the I one think I would, so. I think that would be the one to do it with. I think Husto would take it on in a heartbeat. But you know what? After we've had this discussion, we really actually brainstormed. I think you're right. When you circle back to Rocky, I think you could see one coming out of Rocky. I see Rocky wanting to do it. Yeah. And, I, and uh, you know, I think it would be, I think it would make the most sense. Uh, and there's a lot you could pick from. I, I like the idea of the vintage uh, San Andreas. Mm. That's, that's a good one. It just would look very, very nice um, to see it. And it's at a reasonable price and stuff like yep. that. Yeah. I think it, I think when you really like look at it again, like yeah, Rocky actually makes a lot of sense. It's, look, it's a good sized brand. Um, there's there's some blends that he has that I think would be perfect for that. And uh, who else better to sell it than Rocky Patel? You know what I mean? I think that would be huge. Uh, yeah, and like I said, you know, a lot of folks um, really pay attention to the Rocky stuff that's come out in the last eighteen months. Like I can't help but say it again, it's been just quality quality products. Um, Oh yeah, I agree. Uh, something, something is, you know, whatever is, is something's working very well for him right now, and he's it, whether it's his tobacco is really good or just the production's good, but, but uh, like All Saints maybe something four or five years down the road maybe they do, but I don't see. All I Saints could see it eventually. Eventually, but I think yeah. that grand's gotta get a little more legs, uh, to do it. It's you know, and you know, All Saints you gotta just say the job that Mickey Peg has done. Uh, he wants the brand in the pandemic. This guy. Um. Uh, and he's doing everything the right way. I agree. He's done a really good job with his rollout on that. Yeah. Um, and I think that he's going to be successful for years to come. Yeah. I he's I, doing a really, really good job. Good man. He's a good man, too. He is. He's a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've yeah. hung out with him. I've had drinks with him. He's a cool dude. One of the best interviews we did. He, the he let's show loose. <laughs> yeah. The Mickey, the Mickey interview that Bear did uh, is in the top five for sure. Uh, the Bear hug. Ooh, here's uh-huh. one. Here's, here's one. Here's one from Mark. Okay. JFR. Aganorsa. That's another that. one. I didn't even think of that. That's a great one. That yeah. could be that that I could see possibly this year. Yeah, that Aganorsa, even, I, could, I could see. I could see it. And JFR would make some sense. You do they have a good lunatic. relationship with you them. Do a lunatic. And... You do a lunatic. Yeah, do a lunatic Maduro. Yeah. yeah that absolutely. makes a lot of sense. That's a good one. You ever had the JFR, the the um the lunatic perfecto, the Maduro? Yeah, good cigar. First time I had that cigar, I got halfway and I was like, holy shit. I really felt some heat on that. I was not expecting the strength off of that that I got when I first smoked it. I don't know if it was yeah. just, I smoked it at the end of the day too. Yeah. That's my disclaimer. I smoked it out like it was like my fourth or fifth stick of the day. It was at yeah. the end of the day. But man, I let that up and I was like, wow, this is great. And it tasted great. It's a great cigar. I got halfway through and I was like, whoa, I'm buzzing. This is yeah. strong. Mark, that, Mark, that's a good one. Uh, I've been put that as my second choice behind Rocky right now. Uh, I'm going to stick with Rocky, but I could see that one. I, I think we'll see an Aganor Salif one in the next year or two. JFR so. does those minis with closed foot. The Maduro is SA. They already have the molds. That's a good point. That's a good oh, argument. There you go. It's a good argument. I could there see that. Go. But it fits in with the whole Lun- Lunatics, a, an offshoot of JFR that is weird sizes unusual sizes that's what that that's what that line specializes in right um it's artistic sizes and um i'd like to see nick do a maduro for the firecracker 
I think that's still possible. I don't think Nick Perdomo's done with that. I why think not? That, why yeah. not? He's got the molds now. Yeah. Yeah. Why not do a different Perdomo? I think now a, you're doing a, a different with, Perdomo would be yeah. still. You could do it. You could do a 10th anniversary maybe with it. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. That's actually a perfect one. Yeah. I think, you, you know, um, especially like right now while 10th Maduro is really hot. If you could kind of get that going for the next few years, I think, yeah, that would, uh, that would be an interesting one. Actually. That's a good point. Yeah. One that I know that they probably won't do, but you know, it would be interesting if they could put it together. A point day one. Yeah. I don't, I don't, know, if I don't it, know if it would happen, but if they did it, you know, it would be like, wow. You do an Opus X. Whether it's an Opus, Opus or not, probably would be because a lot of the stuff that they do is usually like an Opus when they do a special. That's why I'm kind of thinking Opus with that too. So maybe, I don't, you know. And would you be able to get them? <laughs> this would be the next question. Yeah, it would be a huge demand. That I would mean, definitely be one that would be a huge demand for. And I think it would be gone. That would probably break their record for the fastest they've ever sold them out. Um, especially the way you look at, you look at what happened with Abe last year with the, the Great Smoke Opus, the, the online. Like, see how crazy people went for that? I it mean, was. It was. Uh, it, it was funny. He had, he had some bat. He had got a second shipment of that. And he right. put them into the sample packs. Right. Yeah, I remember that. And you know what? It was interesting because, um, you know, I, I started thinking about this. And it's like, yeah, that would definitely be one that it's an easy sell. You know, people would buy it. Yeah. Um, whether or not that they would do it with them, I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, someone someone from the, uh, you know, with the big uh, fundraiser next year, someone's going to donate a pack. Um, it will be me. And you may see that cigar in there. So, oh, uh, there you go. Yeah. So you may see that in there. I have to figure that out. It's quite, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I will be donating my own pack because I didn't do that last year and I want to do that this year. So it'll be a good pack for sure. But that would be a good one to put in there. Wait, you talking about my fundraiser? Your fundraiser. Yeah. I didn't oh, my fundraiser? I, yeah. I'm going to donate. Oh. A, I'm going to donate my own personal pack this year. Oh, you are? Oh, OK. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. I don't even know why that just flew right over my you head. Know, here's what happened. I was going to do it last <laughs> year. You guys were getting ready to leave, right, for uh, for Florida. And yeah, people were like donating stuff the last minute. I said, I'm not adding another one in there for them, but I and I would have had time, but I said next year I'm gonna do it. So yeah, there'll be something in there for me. So who knows? Oh. Maybe I'll throw one of them in there. Well, we appreciate that, Coop. Yeah. That's really yeah. uh that's really I'm, kind of you. I'm excited about that. So yeah, but no, yeah. that'll be that'll be cool. Yeah. But yeah, we Opus are X we are will, putting that together. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Uh Opus X will be uh but Opus X would be a good firecracker. I, I think it still would be a very good firecracker. I think so too. And Yeho firecracker, yeah. Yeah, you could do in Yeho. You could do Opus X. Yep. Mm, trying to think. I, yeah, I would be those two. If I was. I don't know if I would do like a Don Carlos. I think it would be either Opus or an Inyeo. Yeah. That would I, make think it, I think Opus would make the sense, though. It's got the... But I just my only issue, I think, I think it's a long shot because of, of getting that cigar. Uh, and yeah. His timing and all that. Dave's, I know, likes to have that before 4th of July. So that could be, you know, I think that would take a lot of planning to do that. Well, they've done some other releases that were not the Fourth of July. I think right, they could do it as a one-off, like you do, like what they did with the HVC. You know, yeah, whatever. which they could do, but I think if he was to do it with them, there'd be a lot of hype on that one. He'd probably want yeah. it for the Fourth of July release. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of questions there. I don't know if, like I said, I don't know if they would do it, but in theory, that would be one that would really make a lot of sense too. Yep. Um, it, people would go crazy for it. But yeah, I agree. That's uh. That remains to be seen. So yeah. that's uh that's pretty much everything that I've got. Me too. Yep. We I know we went very late, but no, this is great. There's a lot of fun tonight. Yeah, Chad Manson. I think the firecracker box needs to stay around $150 though. Opus would be how much? It's a good point. Opus That's would... why I think it would have to be a one off they do with something like that. Like yeah, yeah that's, it, what... that's true. If they did it that's why I don't think they'll do ever do uh, out of Bay Byron. It's uh, it's kind of on the same lines. I think it's just no. I don't think they would, especially with the price point that it would demand. But I would say if they did it in Opus, it would not be 150. But I think people would still obviously go crazy for it. Yeah. Um. So I think it would still work, even if it was 300 dollars or 350 for the box instead of 150. Um. You know, I I mean, they're smaller cigars. Because I mean, I mean, the ones from last year for TGS, those was ten, they were ten. They were like four hundred. I think everything else was like around a hundred, and those were four hundred. So I mean, it, 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 I would say it still can be done, even with that price change. It could still be done, but yeah, um, 
but I don't know. Yeah, that's it. That's all I got. So um, really quick before we finish up, thank you to everyone who is watching yep. and listening at home. Thank you as well. Um, if you haven't seen, um, if you haven't seen our schedule. So we, like I said before, we have Abe coming on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern for a very special show. Uh, Abe's going to talk about the great smoke and he's going to announce some, some new things regarding that. So just, that's all I'm going to say. So just keep an eye out for that. And then next Thursday on our regular scheduled programming, we have Michael Herklotz from uh, Ferry Otego rejoining us for his um, trip back to the Smoke and Tobacco show. We'll catch up with him and talk about, um, you know, we talked to him just as he announced Ferry Otego. Yep. So now we're going to talk to him and follow up with, you know, everything's out and kind of just catch up with Michael and see how he's doing yep. and what That's he's good. up with. Yep. Um, Coop, what do you got coming up this week? Um, so we just recorded right before the show, uh, jukebox episode 60. We're going through still the Rolling Stone top 500 cigars of the year. Uh, scars, no songs, <laughs> songs, songs, songs of all time, songs of yeah. all time. So yeah, that will air on Monday. Tuesday is the big cigar aficionado bracketology show. It's the most comprehensive show, um, on a cigar aficionado breakdown, um, I'm happy to say last year we, we, we nailed all 25 brands. Um, we just didn't nail all the, everything size wise or blend wise, but we were very, we did nail the blends, the, the, the brands, which was good. Um, and then next Thursday, we, we have a primetime show, but we are actually figuring out which guest it's going to be right now because we hear double books. So uh, I have to kind of oh go through some stuff with that. So uh, stay tuned with that uh, as well. And then Abe's coming on with Bear and I on the 18th. So we'll be doing a show with Abe, uh, and I'm sure there'll be more great smoke. We, we kind of, uh, it's good. I think we're all doing these because there's different announcements. Like last year when we had Abe on, he announced the Fuente Cigar on our show. So I'm guessing he's going to announce the Booth Cigar on your show is my guess, but we'll see. And we'll have to see. We'll yep. have to see about yep. that. Yep. Yep. Um, but that's it. That's all we got. So same spiel as always. Like, follow, subscribe. Um, Everywhere podcasts are available. Yep. Find us on our YouTube channel and everywhere on social media. And also, don't forget to check out smokeytobacco.com yep. as well as Cigar Coop while you're at it. Yep. Awesome uh, website. You should definitely check that one out. Actually, too. both two awesome websites. And we'll be back in two weeks. Um, and we'll be doing this again, which is yep. always a great way to spend an evening. Absolutely. All right, guys, that's going to do it. Take care from the Drew Estate Cigar Studios. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>